Good evening. Welcome to the Arlington School Committee meeting. It is Thursday, November 13th, 2014. Before we begin the regular meeting, I would like to recognize Ms. Harrison, our AEA representative. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bodie. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hainer. Um, this evening, we are beginning the school committee meeting with a very special uh, ceremony and award. Uh, this last year, as, as everyone knows, was our, we had a, our first year at Thompson Elementary School, and as a community, we are very proud of this school. It, represented, it represents the efforts of many people to make this a reality. But one of the things that I don't think that people do know is that um, as part of this project, we work very closely with the MSBA in making it a green school. And this evening, um, we are receiving an award from CHIPS, which is the um, organization that actually set the, the green standards for the MSBA. So a little bit of background, um, CHIPS, actually this is Massachusetts CHIPS, it stands for Collaborative for High Performance Schools. And this company began in California in 1999 with the goal of improving the quality of educational facilities for children. It quickly gained momentum and many states recognized its value for providing criteria for high performance green designs. CHIPS is a point-based program with required prerequisites. There are seven categories of integration innovation, indoor environmental quality, energy, water, site, materials and waste management, and lastly, operations and maintenance. To achieve the mass chips verify status, you need 40 points minimum. To achieve the Massachusetts chips verified leader, you need 50 points. Thompson achieved mass chips verified leader the highest level by achieving 53 points. Verified leaders are very hard to achieve. Thompson was the second in the state to achieve this level and third in the nation. So the committee that some of the members of the committee are here this evening and, certain, and I want to introduce a few of the people before we move forward with um, uh, our speakers this evening. Um, from, first of all, let me just just start uh, with members of the committee that are here this evening. Um, from the school committee, we have Jeff Thielman, um, Adam Chapelain, who's our town manager and who will be speaking as well tonight, Dominic Lanzalotti, um, and I think that's all that's here right now from the, the, the actual committee. Oh, and Karen Tassoni, absolutely. And <laughs> Diane Johnson. And Diane Johnson. Thank you very much. So, this committee worked hard for several years to achieve um, the, this beautiful building. And we also have here tonight our new principal of Thompson Elementary School, Karen Donato. We also have uh, our esteemed selectman, Joe Curo, who was on the school committee a number of years ago. And we have um, a Mr. Fanning from the Finance Committee, as well as um, our architects from HMFH who were just um, very wonderful to work with. They had terrific ideas about how we could achieve um, our vision. And tonight, uh, for, let me introduce you, Susan Elmore, and we also have Chris Vance. And Chris is going to speak tonight a little bit about what the actual green initiatives were in the school. So at this end, uh, end then, very important person tonight, <laughs> is um, uh, Carolyn Sarno, who is the Vice President of the CHIPS Board of Directors. And she is here tonight to present the award to us and talk a little bit more about the, the, uh, what the award means. So I think I have everybody that, that is here tonight that has played an important part in, in this reality. And of course, there's the school committee itself, who has been uh, cheering us along through the whole process and certainly a staunch supporter of having this uh, new and wonderful building. So I'm going to uh, right now introduce our town manager, Adam Chapelain. He's going to say a few words and then we'll follow with, with Chris and then uh, Carolyn Sarno. Thank you, Superintendent. Good evening, members of the school committee. 
Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I really just wanted to come tonight to say congratulations to the committee on this accomplishment. Congratulations to the Thompson School Building Committee. Uh, I, I think I'm so happy uh, that we achieved this and that the school committee achieved this because it fits in with the town's real larger organizational goals to promote sustainability and energy efficiency. Uh, it fits in in line with the Highland Fire Station, which is LEED Silver certified, the uh, Central Fire Station, which we're uh, trying to achieve LEED Silver, maybe LEED Gold. Uh, and it's just great that as we renew our portfolio, uh, we're building it sustainably, we're designing it sustainably, uh, and we're, in this instance, we're helping create a space where the students that are in the building can be in a sustainable building and learn what that means. And I think that's great for our future generations to uh, gain an understanding of the importance of uh, sustainability and how you can do it economically effectively as well. Uh, and I think the Thompson uh, School is a great example of all of that. So again, congratulations. Thank you for all of your efforts uh, to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, would you like to come up? But I also um, want to um, acknowledge Charlie Foskett, who is chairman of the Capital Committee as well as vice chair of the Finance Committee, who was very instrumental in working with us and having achieving this beautiful building. Chris, thank you, Dr. Bodie. Um, so I just want to say it was wonderful working with the Town of Arlington and the School <coughs> Building Committee to um, achieve this really prestigious award. Um, to get uh, chips. Leader, uh, verified leader is actually very difficult and not a lot of schools can uh, meet this criteria. And as Dr. Bodie said, that we're the second in Massachusetts um, and we missed getting the first by a month from a, another building actually in, that our firm designed um, and you know, third in the nation. So it's a, it's a great accomplishment. And so I can speak uh, you know, briefly to some of the green initi initiatives that we took to um, achieve this. And I don't know if you guys have uh, been to the school, but um, this plaque here that's printed in black and white, um, unfortunately, I apologize that our color plotter decided not to uh, work today, but um, if you walk in at the main entrance here on North Avenue, you'll actually see this plaque, and um, there's various numbers throughout that explain some of the green initiatives that we um, took to achieve some of the, the points to um, get uh, verified leader. And um, as Dr. Brody said, there are seven categories, um, and you had to get 50 points to get the le verified leader. And we achieved, we, well, we, on the onset, we were looking to get 55, and we ended up getting 53. So it was a pretty good, a good goal, and you know, we, we achieved it. Uh, we missed two points, um, uh, which wasn't, wasn't bad. So one of the big um, pieces that went into the green design was really citing the building. And um, as you can see, that the main academic wing here um, was cited or was cited parallel um, on the east-west axis and what that helps do is really control daylight and it allows you to harvest the daylight so we have sunscreens that are on the south side and light shelves that allow um, natural light to bounce deeper into the space which reduces your electrical demand so you can turn down the um, lights and we have sensors that are in the ceiling that actually reads the light levels and can dim the light um, as necessary. So during the day, your electric demand is really reduced. So that was one of the, um, the big pieces. Um, we also worked to um, install all low flow toilets and low flow fixtures. So we had a, a huge water reduction um, for this school. And one of the goals was to also not have any landscape irrigation um, and using any sort of potable water for irrigation. Um, so that was a, um, a big initiative there. Um, another one is the um, life cycle cost analysis. So we really analyzed the different um, mechanical equipment that went into the building to see um, what was going to have the longest life um, span and for the cost and um, energy consumption. And so we did a lot of extensive energy modeling um, that, to achieve some of these points. Um, we also used a lot of renewable um, materials, rapidly renewable and recyclable materials. So a lot of the um, concrete block that is on the exterior walls is actually made from a highly recycled content um, CMU. So we, we achieved points for that. And all the flooring in the building is um, a linoleum, which is a rapidly renewable resource. So we received a lot of um, points for that, for using this rapidly renewable resource within the building. We also um, used low VOC paints, so there was not a lot of off-gassing. Um, and we also did an extensive flush out of the building. There's a seven day flush out where 
no constructions happening, and basically turn all the, the air handlers on at full, and it just sucks everything out of the building so that when the students enter, you're, they're not gonna be exposed to any of those toxins that are off-gassing from the materials. Um, and let's see if there are a few of the other ones. Um, we use a lot of native plant species that wouldn't require a lot of irrigation. I want to be extensive for landscaping. Um, we also worked um, really with the community for um, public um, transit, so uh, providing bike space, a lot of bike racks so that students that are commuting there um, can utilize that space. And we also, because this school is in a, um, a dense urban neighborhood, there really isn't a front door. Um, so we have two access points. And so we worked at um, siting it with the park and within the neighborhood context to be transit um, uh, commuter oriented. Um, and we also have achieved some points for shared facilities. I'm working with the park and the school to um, share some of those facilities. So overall, there are a lot of um, great green initiatives that went into the project. And um, as George Metzger, the principal of our company, says that you know, with great clients come great buildings. And I think that uh, this is a culmination of that. And it was great working with the Thompson uh, School Building Committee. Well, one of the other benefits besides having this prestigious award is that um, when you have additional points, you also get a higher level of reimbursement um, from the state. And, and we were able to um, get over to close to 52%, which is um, an increase in where we started, which was in the high 40. So that was an added benefit. But I think there's mixed motivation. One was, of course, um, being able to do that, but uh, but I think that everyone in the committee was very committed to having a, a school that was green, sustainable, and a beautiful environment for our, for our students. So I'd like to uh, welcome right now um, Carolyn Sarno, who is, as I said, the vice vice president of CHIPS Board of Directors. So. Thank you, Superintendent Bodie and members of the school committee. It's my honor to be here tonight on behalf of the Collaborative for High Performance Schools to recognize you for this great accomplishment. Uh, not only am I here on behalf of CHIPS, but I also work, uh, I'm wearing two hats tonight. I work for Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships, which is a regional entity that's in Lexington, and we work throughout the 12 states in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic. And we're funded in part by the Department of Energy to help provide technical guidance and support to municipalities and state agencies. And one thing that we helped to do was to help create the mass chips uh, criteria. Uh, and so I was part of that stakeholder process. So it's truly an honor for me to sit and help develop that criteria and then to see these uh, school buildings through fruition. Um, so it's, it's, it's truly an honor to be here tonight. Um, and most importantly for us and what we really feel is that our schools matter, our students matter, the staff that are in the schools and your principal matter. Uh, and your dedication to building um, Thompson Elementary School as a mass chip school and creating a healthy and energy efficient school building shows that you recognize and value that the built environment matters and it matters to our learning process and how um, you know, to create the best possible learning environment that we can. So on behalf of the Collaborative Fire Performance Schools, we acknowledge your contribution and welcome Thompson Elementary School to the distinguished ranks of facilities um, across the nation um, who are leading the movement and how students will learn in these amazing facilities. And we join you and thank you for joining CHIP's mission to make ideal places to learn. So thank you on behalf of Bill Orr, the Executive Director, and the Collaborative for High Performance Schools. Where's uh, Mr. Sprague when you need him? <laughs> I take care of him. There's not the same Sprague. Contributed in any way uh, yes. to this project. 
Yes, Thank for you. this generation and the next. And we will yeah. be putting this plaque up in the school. At Thompson? Sorry. All right. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, right. for the thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who came and shared this with us. And you want, you want to take your... <laughs> Even though it's black and white. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we're moving on to another right. um, topic of energy this evening. Mm -hmm. it seems to be At this time, I'd like to invite Mr. Chaplain to come up to the table. Solar panel, town of Arlington. Solar, solar, go solar. Nope, I'm fine. I'm good. This only works because of this town manager's son and person. That's who these other people are who I didn't know, so I'm like. Good job. Because I haven't met her yet. Yeah, yeah. The one sitting next to I'm like, there's two women sitting on either side of <laughs> What she looks like. So if I ran her over, I'd know. It's a lot better. <laughs> and I would ask the people at the table that when you talk, bring the mic as close as you can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think the Board of Selectmen might be getting jealous. I've been here so often recently. <laughs> I know. Um, we've seen a lot of you. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to give a brief uh, introduction and then allow uh, the team from Amoresco to give a, a brief overview of the work that they've been doing for the town and then answer questions that the committee has. Uh, so uh, starting uh, earlier this year, uh, really under the, the leadership of Ruthie Bennett, the town's uh, shared energy manager with Bedford, uh, we pursued an owner's agent technical assistance grant uh, through the state to help us hire an outside group to uh, start uh, considering uh, solar projects on uh, the roofs of town buildings. Uh, we were awarded that grant and we started working with the Cadmus group and what they helped us do is uh, take a look at several proposals that had been uh, performed through joint procurements uh, that the town was a part of for solar developers. Uh, that review resulted in the town selecting uh, Amoresco, who's here tonight, uh, to work with as a solar developer. Uh, what they've done in the, or started to do uh, is assess uh, a number of school buildings and town buildings for their suitability for uh, the placement of uh, solar panels for energy generation. Uh, so I'll let them talk about that. Um, where we go from here after they talk is they make uh, some recommendations about what's possible based on our roof space. Uh, we negotiate a power purchase agreement whereby they place the solar panels on the school roofs and then we buy energy from them uh, at a rate lower than what we would buy from the grid and that would really be the, the goal of that. Um, and I um, lost my train of thought. And, and the details uh, w within that would work out what would happen if solar panels, uh, if the panels were removed to do a roof replacement. Uh, there's obviously still a lot of questions to be answered about what we would be doing here uh, for this building, whether or not it would be practical given the, uh, you know, the questions that are up in the air about uh, a potential construction project here. Uh, so, oh, and that, that's what I, I wanted to add. Before we finalize that, I presume we'll be back before the school committee asking for the committee's actual execution of a licensing agreement for the use of school buildings that would be um, included in this project. Uh, so this is sort of a presentation, question and answer, and then we most likely would be back again in the future. Uh, so with that, Ruthie, did you want to say anything no, no, before? I didn't. I'm here to answer questions. So we okay. Can MRS go. So we have uh, Ed Lapori from Amoresco, and I'll let him introduce his team. Hi. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Superintendent, committee members. My name is Ed Lapori, and I'm a senior account executive with Amoresco's business development group. Uh, Amoresco is one of the largest independent energy services and renewable energy companies in North America. Also representing Amoresco to my right. Jerry Cantor. Jerry is a project development manager with our solar PV grid tide group. And also John Bamman to my right, who is a senior project manager, also with our solar group. Um, so Amoresco um, was incorporated in 2000. And in 2010, uh, we became publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. 
Uh, in 2013, uh, we did about $630 million in revenue. Um, and we've completed over $3 billion worth of energy solutions. Our corporate office is located in Framingham, Massachusetts. However, we do have uh, approximately 66 offices in North America. Uh, there's 34 offices, um, there's 66 offices in 34 states, and also five offices in Canadian provinces. Um, so I wanted to just talk briefly about the Metropolitan Area Planning Council's regional energy procurement. Uh, in 2011, Metropolitan Area Planning Council issued this regional procurement, and 14 cities and towns, including Arlington, participated in it. Um, the request for qualifications was issued in July of 2011. The MAPC group received eight proposals. There was a selection committee um, that was made up of a different uh, participating cities and towns. And the selection committee shortlisted or picked three companies to interview as finalists. Um, and subsequently, Amoresco was selected uh, as the energy services provider um, for the town and 13 other cities and towns. So we're really excited about this renewable energy project. I am especially, I grew up in Arlington. I attended the Stratton Elementary School, uh, the Audison Middle School, and Arlington High School. So a lot of good old memories here. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so Jerry is prepared to talk a little bit more about the details specific to the solar projects town-wide, and then John and our construction group can answer any construction-related questions. So Jerry? So as Adam noted, one of the first things we did was look at all of the schools within Arlington to decide which ones were actually good candidates for solar. Um, I'll direct your attention to the slide up here, and you'll see the six we selected. Now, we did look at all of them, and when I say which ones are good candidates, what I mean is a few things. So first, is there actually physically a space for the solar panels on top of the rooftop? Second, if there is, will the panels be too shaded to make it worthwhile, whether by rooftop equipment, nearby buildings, trees, etc.? So some of the other schools within the school district, it was determined there was either too much shading or not enough space for panels. Once we completed that initial screen and selected these six schools, we then had to do a structural review to make sure there was sufficient reserve capacity for the solar on these schools. And those results have come in and they are. To let you know, the system size in kilowatts here and then the production in kilowatt hours on the column on the right, those are preliminary numbers from our initial screening. We expect to have our engi a 30 percent engineering design, which is our next phase of design, come in next week. So those numbers might change a little bit. We'll find out next week. Um, just to give you some context on what this means, so for the Arlington High School, for instance, 206,000 kilowatt hours a year, that would be roughly 13, 14 percent of the high school's annual production. For the other schools, it's going to range from about a third to maybe 45 percent of the annual production of the schools. Um, I want to let you know these are ballasted systems, which means they are weighted down on the rooftop by blocks and separated from the rooftop by a membrane. We do not penetrate the roof. And I will have John to my left speak a little bit more about what that means in the construction process. But before I do that, I wanted to point out that we also have an educational offering that goes along with our solar array. And you can think of it as being in three parts. The first is a website. Uh, Ruthie has some samples. She can pass around a screenshot of a live website. And it shows in real time Careful, Ruthie. the data from the production of the system, weather data, as well as greenhouse gas reduction and some of the environmental benefits of the system for each rooftop. The data can also be downloaded, um, which will, will feed into um, our curriculum, which I'll mention in a moment. <coughs> Part two is a kiosk or a monitor. Um, the school district can select a school or as many as you like to have an LCD screen mounted in the school or some other building if you prefer, the town hall, whatever you like. So everyone walking by can see the production as an ongoing basis. Finally, we have developed a curriculum um, to go along with the solar, the renewable energy, and it's in 15 phases. Everything from what is renewable energy to how to analyze the data that comes out of the uh, data acquisition system, which is what appears on the website. 
And the curriculum is segregated by grade level, so the different curriculum for middle school, elementary school, and high school as well. I'd like to pass this off to John right now, and he will give you a little bit of an overview of the construction process. We have worked with many schools in Massachusetts and other states and are very cognizant of some of the requirements of not disturbing the students. Uh, good evening, all. Thank you for having us here. Um, I, I don't want to uh, spend a lot of time talking about the, the, the nuts and bolts of, uh, of the construction process. Um, it's, for me, it's exciting. For you, it'd probably be boring. Uh, but in, uh, in the, the, bar, the, large, uh, the large scope is, is really um, that uh, we bring all our equipment to uh, the particular site, each one of these schools, uh, probably on a Friday, Friday afternoon. We try to space it in between uh, drop off in the morning and pick up in the afternoon, cognizant of traffic with, with the, the uh, buses and so forth. Uh, stage that on a Friday, lift everything to the roof on a Saturday. When the, when the school, uh, the building is empty. Um, and then we're kind of out of sight and out of mind. Uh, a a typical, typical crew will be about six to eight electricians uh, who will access the roof from the outside of the building. Generally, some buildings lend themselves uh, to access within the building, but with security concerns these days, um, we either set up an, an exterior um, scaffolding uh, with a stair ladder or access via uh, extension ladders so we can get to the roof and, and down uh, without going inside the school. Uh, obviously, uh, significant um, security issues around quarry and fingerprinting these days. Uh, all of our crews go through that process before they even uh, enter the, the school grounds. Um, installation takes, depending on the size of the system, six weeks, six to eight weeks. If we can schedule that during the summer, that's great. If it happens uh, during school, uh, school time, that's not an issue. As, uh, as Jerry mentioned, these, uh, these modules are weighted down on the roof. They're not physically attached, so there's no drilling or screwing or bolting. Everything gets carried and placed on the, on the deck, and the weight is what holds the, the system in place. Um, at the end of the project, uh, we'll bring a crane in again on a Saturday or a it happens to be a holiday. We'll be lifting actually the day after, after Thanksgiving. We, we did some work um, and um, uh, oftentimes we'll work on holidays as well because many of these schools are busy 24 7, seven days a week, uh, especially high schools. Um, in the, at the tail end of the project, we'll bring a crane in again and offload um, crates and pallets and tools and that sort of thing and then commission the system and, and start making electricity. Um, so I'd like to open the floor to, to questions. Um, so what happens if uh, something were to happen to the panel? So we've had a couple of storms that happened, you know, tree falls. I know no trees will be directly above it, but <laughs> right. from far away. <laughs> right. Um, are, is Arlington liable at all in, in those I mean, is there any certain circumstance in which Arlington would be responsible for costs for fixing? Um, I, th I think you would call it negligence if there was a... Right, but a, not, not the negligence. normal stuff. Other than that, um, Amoresco installs, owns, and operates and maintains the system for the duration of the contract. So that really is our responsibility. These modules, by definition, are modular. Mm -hmm. um, they're units of roughly five feet wide, three feet tall. So uh, if one breaks or becomes faulty, that one's lifted out and another yeah, one is just fine. plugged in. It's, it's, a, it's a very flexible system that way. And it, it, it allows us to design around obstructions on the roof to, to design our arrays uh, to take the, the, the make best utilization of available space. Can I have one more? Sure. So I have one more. Um, so do we have any idea of the projected cost savings and where do those cost savings go? Well, yeah. that, be, that was my question. <laughs> that would be for Jerry or... Yeah, do we pay for our own so, electricity? Right, so does, yeah. does that go back to the schools? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So we are at the point actually right now where Amoresco is finishing the analysis, the 30 percent design, and we'll come up with the price mm -hmm. based on how many roofs and how much it costs mm -hmm. to put them on. And so we are about 10 days away from that conversation. Actually, mm -hmm. we have a conference call scheduled. So we don't know yet um, the exact price. The savings we'll be able to figure out once we understand our price. 
Um, you know, in terms of the savings, that's money that's sort of not spent mm -hmm. in the school budgets. I will not even begin to discuss how that gets worked out, but, um, you know, we will know um, in the beginning of each year what we think it will be, and we'll also be able to say, we'll be able to true up at the end of each year to figure out what the savings were. Mm -hmm. um, we have that already now in, in some of the schools in terms of other upgrades that we've done. You can see the budget for utilities is, you know, not being spent as fast or as much as it has been in, in previous years. Is that then? This time. Oh, okay. So mine are similar. I was wondering, do we, we pay for our own electricity currently? That comes out of our budget. So that was my question as well. The savings comes back to us. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, my other question was, um, as uh, Adam alluded to, um, we are planning on probably tearing this building down and rebuilding it. So um, I wonder how, I mean, obviously, they're mobile and movable and modular. Um, how much and is that included in all of this should that occur how do we wait do we install it and hope that we get five years and then move it i don't i would like to i can speak to that as well as i'm a resco so there's sort of two issues one is with a regular school that's not being torn down there might right. be need to redo the roof or there's a repair right. and so they are modular we can take them down fix the roof put them back um, with the high school, it's a bigger issue because it'll be a number of years that the building won't be right. utilized. We can find another place to put the panels for that time. We could have them not working for that time. Um, so there's ways to handle this school and any other school. The other question that we're going to work out is if we don't get electricity from the panels because it won't fulfill all of our needs, we still will be buying from the grid. Right. So if the panels are down, we have, you know, we will have to budget to buy from the grid. It'll affect the price of Amoresco. With the high school, it'll be a bigger issue. It's a number of years. With a roof, it's two to three weeks, so it's a smaller issue. So we're having that concept in the contract. Okay. It's hard to say exactly what it will, what the effect will be, because we don't know when this building will be taken down, mm -hmm. and we right. don't know which roofs will be need to be repaired. So mm -hmm. it's right. conceptually we know, but specifically we don't have details. Okay. If you want to. Just to note that we have dealt with both a temporary roof repair um, or a full building removal of the system in place at elsewhere with other school districts, and so we'll work out the details in the contract. We're, we're used to this. <laughs> 20 years is a long time. Um, and one last, is there any other buildings in town that are going to have these or just the schools? Um, so we looked at every building in town. The schools are the best. <laughs> Right, they, right, well, because right. they have the flattest roofs and, you know, like, the uh, slate. You know, ABGC comes to mind. They have that big flat roof right on the well, pond. Yes. I, think, <laughs> I, I think they actually are pursuing it on their own. Oh, okay. I, I remember hearing Derek Curran make some mention of it. I, okay. I'm not positive of that, but that rings a bell. Okay. But this is, as far as town buildings, these are the only yeah. ones in town. We're okay. also looking at um, two potential parking lots um, and one side of a DPW garage roof. So we're, right. <laughs> we're looking everywhere, but these were... Sure. Yeah. Simpler. Great. Right, thanks. Mr. Pierce. All my questions have been asked. <laughs> I've got questions. <laughs> she's, she's the solar whiz here. <laughs> I've got a 5.2 system on my roof. Um, and so one question that comes up after having gone through this is, are there um, SRECs available from these and how are those handled? So the system will generate SRECs, but as Amoresco is the owner of the system, the SRECs go to Amoresco. And then the power is sold back to Arlington through what's called a power purchase agreement. OK. Um, so the SRECs are something, for people who aren't aware, the SRECs are a certificate that the power companies have to buy if they don't generate their own renewable energy. And it's a commodity, and the prices go up and down. Um, but it's another thing, it's another benefit that comes from having solar panels. Um, this question's more for um, the town manager. I'm just wondering if we've looked hard at the economics of buying versus, I, I don't know if this is leasing or, or, or what you'd call what, we're, what this is, but if there's mm -hmm. any chance, I mean, I'd be wondering about the payback just for the town potentially buying as opposed to. So the, the Board of Selectmen actually asked for the same 
uh, same analysis. So Ruthie and I have discussed about putting together the analysis. W without having that prepared yet, I'm, I'm fairly oh. confident uh, in the strength of that analysis that it would be a better deal for us to go in this manner. And, and frankly, knowing what we all know about our, our already strained capital budgets, coming up with the upfront capital can be a strain upon itself. Uh, so the sooner you start generating renewable energy, the sooner you start you know, saving. Um, and I felt like there's another part of your uh, question. That, that, that was mostly oh, okay. yeah, one thing to that. Also, so since Amoresco owns it, they also operate and maintain it. So another sort of cost to us would be personnel to be trained and maintaining and operating. And so I think they can speak to it. And I actually also have a system on my roof. Um, and I think there's very few municipalities um, that have actually invested up front because, A, it's very expensive, but B, also over time, you have to create a whole cadre of people who manage it, where we can just call them and say, it broke, can mm -hmm. you fix it? <laughs> and they actually incentivize to fix it because if it doesn't produce energy, we're not buying it okay. from them. So it's, it's a mutually beneficial arrangement and we don't have to watch. You know, I mean, there's one on the Odyssey right now, but does anybody really remember that or watch it? I mean, we know how much energy it's, it's <laughs> creating, but we, we don't have to watch it because Amoresco will be watching it with mm us. -hmm. Okay. Um, then is it possible to add additional panels? You know, if we expand the roof in the high school as it's renovated, can we add another chunk? Yeah, yes, of course, yep. Okay. Um, and then the other questions are about the Stratton. I know in the past there's been concerns about the snow accumulating and that the Stratton was one of the schools that had, the roof was old enough that there was concern that there was too much snow and we had to shovel it. And I'm wondering, is that the same section that we're talking about putting the solar panels on, or is that the other part? Well, my understanding is that the panels are going on the new roof. Okay. Is it? Um, Stratton. That's the new roof. Yep. That's the new roof, yeah. Yeah, okay. And that, that part was okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, those are my questions. Thank you. If we were to put these on the high school, you, you see, your proposal would be to put these in the high school, and if we renovate the high school or, or rebuild it, or would they be taken down and then put in the new high school? How does that, and that's cost effective? <laughs> I, I think ultimately it, it becomes an economic question. Yeah. Uh, once uh, the, the further engineering, uh, once we receive that further engineering information that was mentioned earlier, and we get a better understanding of what Amoresco's price proposal will be, they'll, they'll have built into that proposal some assumption of what would happen to the panels that could be on this building, and then we'll have to make a decision of whether yeah. or not it economically makes sense. Thank you. Uh, you following the previous uh, presentations on energy saving and stuff like this, <laughs> Do we get points with MSBA uh, for having a system already? Get brownie points. I don't forget. Well, the chip points. I'm looking for money points. Yes. Uh, to be very well, honest with you. I mean, I think the, the answer to that would be with Thompson. I think we did receive uh, a chips point yeah. for making it solar ready. Okay. Uh, so there was that benefit, so. which had the sort of indirect, sort of direct MSBA benefit, and then a future design and construction of this high school, we would right. certainly benefit from making it solar ready. The other question I have being a teacher of flat roofs in New England with all the snow and everything, mm -hmm. uh, eventually they have to, the snow has to be removed. The, it, does this keep snow off the roof itself? Uh, is there a spacing or something? I'm just concerned about our staff doing damage and the liability aspects to it. The, uh, the modules are, are self-cleaning. Um, we don't recommend them they be shoveled off or the snow removed. In, in fact, in the uh, part of the um, calculations of, of these kilowatt hour production takes into account historical weather data, including snowfall. And so we anticipate and expect that these modules will be fully covered with snow for periods of, of time during the, during the winter. Uh, by design, they're, they're facing south. They're, dark in color, either, either dark blue or black. So they tend, and they generate a slight bit of heat themselves when they're, when they're operating. So the snow on them tends to melt relatively quickly. Um, but no, there's no, there's no cleaning, there's no shoveling uh, necessary. Now, um, these have to be all designed and engineered according to Mass Massachusetts building code, which requires that the first 45 pounds per square foot of that roof structure has got to be assigned to snow support. So 
if there's only 45 pounds available capacity on the roof, we can't put a panels there. Oh, okay. It's only in, in excess of what the building has, has got to uh, hold for, uh, for the snow, snow load. My other question is the integration between the solar system and the regular power system, uh, that, piece, that, that piece of equipment that integrates the two, whose responsibility is that? Ours, yours, or together? Let me answer that one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah uh, we, we own everything up to what uh, the utility calls the PCC, the point of common coupling. Okay. Um, so anything f mm. from our, our uh, that point to the modules is all ours, and we're, we're tying in right at the transformer that the utility owns, so that there's, it's either is the utility or us, it's not you. Okay. Is, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Just, just to explain that the energy we're getting is coming from the grid and the panels, right. and then it comes in at one location point. Oh. Mm -hmm. So we're always getting... We're always going to be getting energy from the grid because we're not, we're producing a third to 25%. So it's sort of both coming in at the same time at this meter, and that's the, the N star meter. Okay. They both come through that meter. Thank you. Can yes. I? One more question, sorry. Um, what's the wind load that your panels are designed for? You know, I understand they're weighed down, but how strong winds can happen before they start lifting up? Yeah, the Massachusetts Building Code has wind zones built into it, and I'm not sure where Arlington, what zone Arlington is, is uh, situated in, but generally it's around 110 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour, depending on the zone. Uh, all these, these panels and racking systems are all wind tunnel tested, and uh, engineers have to stamp these drawings and uh, uh, make sure that these are going to stay on the roof in those, uh, in those conditions. Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about the microburst that happened so, not that long um, ago. The whole project, every single building will be permitted through the town of Arlington. So it isn't just their engineers. We actually will have to issue permits. So that conversation will happen between our building department and their engineers. Okay, thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's for great. Coming. Thank Looking you. Looking forward thank to working you. with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Sounds exciting. I want to see the readouts. At this time, the school committee uh, will take a roll call vote to enter executive session to discuss a complaint or charges brought against a public officer or official. No open meeting law complaint against the school committee. I'll now call the roll. Uh, yes. 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 Hi. Yes. Yes. We are now entering executive session. To return to the regular meeting. Welcome back to the Arlington School Committee. Uh, at this time, the committee will address an open meeting law complaint filed by Dr. Stephen Harrington against this body. In sum, the complaint alleges that a school committee member violated the open meeting law by writing an email to the chair and copying the rest of the board to request removal of the Community Preservation Act discussion from an agenda. Subsequently, the chair did remove the Community Preservation Act discussion from the agenda. After examination of the complaint, we believe the subject email as well as an email response from the chair should not have been transmitted as they were and the CPA discussion should have either been removed by the chair based on an individual or separate member objections or tabled at an open meeting by a member motion. A committee member may individually write or speak with the chair regarding addition or removal of an item from an agenda under the open meeting law. However, a member, including the chair, may not address a quorum of members by email or otherwise on any public business under our jurisdiction outside of an open meeting or executive session unless it, it is purely administrative communication. The school committee is committed to following the rules of the open meeting law and acknowledges the errors made in this instance. It can be a close, difficult question at times between what is administrative and what is substantive even on matters such as what should or should not be on an agenda. Therefore, this committee's members will endeavor to make sure that any future objections to an agenda item, even upon administrative grounds, are solely expressed from one member to the chair and not amongst a quorum. And further, to examine its agenda setting process generally to ensure both efficient and transparent governments. governance. Excuse me. Thank you. At this time, we we'll, are going to monthly financial report. Uh, do you want to? Yeah. 
paid anything? Did you take a formal vote on that? You don't have to. I'm sorry, you're moving a little faster than I expected. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's booting. <laughs> That's right. No, I can. Just need to boot it up. Um, Thank you very much. Um, there isn't really much to report. Not much has changed in the one month since the last time I reported. Um, special ed tuition is still tracking where it was. It's still under budget. Um, it's too soon in the year to talk about energy and everything else is proceeding as normal. Questions? Anything from the board before I ask my answer? Mr. Schlickman. Uh, we're up, uh, we're, we're under $591,000, basically, on teacher salary. We're over. Or we're over. Correct. Uh, okay, so uh, what, what are we going to do about that? We have sufficient, re more than sufficient reserves to cover that. Okay, so that's going to come out of reserve account. And that presumes, as we do at this time of the year, that every single line will be fully expended, which is not historically the case. Mm -hmm. So depending on how the winter turns out or whatever, we would presumably use less of our reserves than that full amount. But that's a worst-case scenario. Okay. Anyone else? The uh, when you when you said special ed tuition, do we have a we have a line item for in-house special education, don't we? Not just one. All of uh, special education is tracked under various programmatic codes. Um, none of these reports actually reflect that in okay. a way that's easy to see because we've we've elected to do this by object code, so you okay. can see salaries all together and electrical all together. Um, I do other reports, as you've seen, for the budget and when we report on the end of the fiscal year that shows it aggregated by other content mm -hmm. areas like special ed. Okay. On the, the uh, first sheet of the budget tracking, it had, uh, and you, I think you just addressed it, the teacher salary and wages at 650000 under. Over. Uh, over, excuse me. And, but down below, full-time teacher aides and salaries, 78000 Over. Now, over. On the back side, it said 591,000. But there's there's some that are under budget as well. Okay. Administrative is under, um, custodial is under, clerical is under, um, other full time is under. Are the the te the the aides correspond to the added teachers? Mm -hmm. No, the aides correspond to the added aides that we did over the summer to address class size, or building subs, or other other educational needs. Okay. And uh, on the second page, the computer supplies. 17,000 and computer equipment, 64,000. Is that expected to track at that loss for the rest of the year? Or if not, if not more. I mean, those are areas that are flexible. When we, when we allocate the budgets to the principals, we give them a certain amount of money to work with for supplies. And it's up to their discretion on whether they want to spend that on textbooks, instructional material, computer equipment, computer supplies. And so it's not uncommon to see overages and underages as, as principals make decisions with their money. But, okay, going So this aggregates, th this view of the reports for the district pulls together all the computer supplies for the district. And so if one teacher elected to, instead of buying instructional, or one principal elected instead of buying instructional materials to buy computer supplies. But shouldn't I see an offset in the instructional supply? Not at this point in the year because I'm still projecting that everybody's going to fully spend their budgets on those lines. So this is, well, this okay, is like that's worst where, case. That was where my original question mm -hmm. came from, that this should average out on the supply. <laughs> at the end of the year, it the will. Supply. But on the, does that apply to the computer equipment and hardware as well? Or is that? The bottom line will average out, line by line. But we budgeted right, if, if and again, I'm <clears throat> at $20,000, and right now we've expended 84000 so we're at 64000 on a negative. Is, did something happen for computer equipment? between when we set the budget? Did we buy something new or? Well, we needed more computers because we added more teachers. And we needed more computers than the capital budget but gave us room to we, buy. So we when were we- planning on $20,000 worth for the, the existing staff. We've spent 84,000, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, we've you bought all, a lot. You, you we folks always have the answer for me. I just don't understand. We, 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 spent, we bought a lot more computers than we were thinking back last March mm -hmm. because we certainly weren't looking to have as many FTEs as we okay. added. Then and when we, did the capital, when we did the capital request, we thought we needed, help me out here with numbers, we needed 400. Right. They gave us enough for 380. We okay. actually needed 420. And so we bought what then, we needed to get everybody beefed up. Going along with your statement, this will average out. 
where is this money going to come from? Well, it's to average it out. It's really unlikely that all of these lines are going to be fully expended. It could come instructional supplies. It could come from textbooks. Okay. Printing and reproduction is a line that I don't think we've ever come close to fully expending. Um, you know, there are lines throughout the budget that vary from year to year based on our needs. I mean, typically when we buy furniture, to give you another example of how this works, say a typical elementary school has a $25,000 supply budget and a principal elects to buy some new furniture. Say they spend $6,000 on furniture. This report would show that we spent $6,000 of unbudgeted furniture. And then at the end of the year, we'd show a savings okay. in something else. But right now, I'm not starting to show savings yet. So we're seeing the worst now. My last question, the foreign visa account, do we get a lot of extra money in that? We seem to be able to, for, for our expenses. We get, we receive tuition from students who come from abroad to study here and that's paid by their parents in foreign countries to us. And that money isn't restricted from being carried year to year like most municipal money. So if we do not fully expend in one fiscal year, it rolls to the next. And we're not limited to where we can expend the Correct. extra Correct, we are free to spend that as we will. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I just have a question about, um, in a couple of places where things were moved to different places, is mm -hmm. this a, um, a change in reporting structure, or is this typical that things get reported one place at the beginning of the year and then get moved? So this is not, this is what happens every year. This is yes. not a change in the way that Yeah, no, reported. there's no change in methodology. Okay, got it, okay. We all set? Thank you, Ms. Johnson. At this time, uh, we will be doing something we do annually. It's superintendent's evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> Slightly different, before we begin, uh, I've had a request that if any member would like to make a, an opening statement or a comment at the beginning, this is your opportunity at the beginning. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I just wanted to um, make a general comment about sort of how I'm approaching this. Since I'm so new to the committee, I didn't answer some of the uh, criteria. I, mean, I just sort of left it blank. I don't have enough basis for evaluation. So, so in terms of what I'm, I'll be doing tonight, um, I do have a suggestion, though, going forward, which is I'd like to sort of have a better understanding about the kinds of evidence that we'd be receiving. So one of the things that I noticed, I mean, I know this is all very new to us. So every, every, it's new to everybody. Um, but as you as you look at each sort of thing to be evaluated, there's a list of, say, 9 to 14 pieces of evidence that you could receive. And I know I'd like to sort of maybe think about what we'd like to see in the future for the next, for the years coming forward. Um, you know, five of those things or something. Great. Yeah. Is there anyone else that would like to? Okay. What we are doing is using the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education form. Uh, I have decided to take things out of the order it's done. The summative evaluation report rating will be done last. I will now read each of the superintendent's performance goals and the ratings that were given. These ratings normally will add up to seven, but as uh, Dr. Seuss just said a moment ago, s several members have, uh, for whatever reason, that may not have given a rating. So do not if they don't add to seven. If it adds to more than seven, please let me know. <laughs> As it did on one, I had to correct it. Okay. Uh, professional practice goal, from September 2013 to May 2014, the focus of three visits to each school will be on an quality, beyond the quality of educator practice, followed by a meeting with the principal to debrief our joint observation in order to improve the quality of feedback to teachers for the purpose of positively impacting student learning and achievement. One, significant progress. Three, met the goal. Three, exceeded the goal. Student learning. Student performance on MCAS 2014 in the aggregate at all levels and at each grade tested will improve from MCAS baseline in 2013. Two, some progress. Five, significant progress. Mm -hmm. District improvement. Taken from the district goals 2.1. Teachers in order to demonstrate proficiency under the new educator evaluation system, which will be implemented in the district during the 2013-2014 school year, 
will be provided with professional development to implement the new system and to improve their instructional practice. One, some progress, six, met the, pro met the goal. Number four, taken from the district goals 3.3, Programs developed by the Special Education Department will foster integration of general education and special education through the use of student support teams, team teaching, embedded teaching, push-in models, and conferencing consultation opportunities that will include at least three new connections interventions at each school by June 2014. Uh, three uh, needs improvement and four, I'm sorry, I'm reading these wrong. Lost the three uh, significant progress and four uh, met the goal. Five, taken from the district goals, 4.4, a projection model for long range multi year planning to be developed by October 13. Four, some progress, and two met the goal. At this time, I will invite any comments from any members if they so choose. Can I ask a question? Sure. I want to ask, it's more procedural. So my understanding is that you as chair are required to fill out something online reflecting our evaluation. Is this correct? What I, what Desi has said that I am to compile and at our previous meeting we agreed that I would compile the ratings but not the comments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you don't have, to, I'm just wondering, you're not going to sit down at a computer and have to pick one of the categories, you know, met or didn't, okay, okay, thank you. The, the, the numbers that I've just read, one of those reflected my rating only. The rest were reflecting of the groups. I added them together, okay. for each, each one of the categories. Right, okay. no, I just, I had thought that you had to go in and actually fill out one of these kind of as the committee. Not at this and, time. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, Don't give them any ideas no, either. No, well Please. that's. <laughs> I agree. Okay, I will now, read each item in the superintendent's performance rating for standard one, instructional leadership, given the ratings for each. <coughs> 1A, curriculum, ensures that all instructional staff design effective and rigorous standards based units of instruction consisting of well-structured lessons with measurable outcomes. Six profession, one exemplary. 1B, instruction, ensures that practices in all settings reflect high expectations regarding content and quality of effort and work, engage all students and are personalized to accommodate diverse learning styles, needs, interests, and levels of readiness. Six, profession, proficient. C, assessment, ensures that all principals and administrators facilitate practice that propel propel personnel to use a variety of formal and informal methods and assessments to measure student learning, growth, and understanding and make necessary adjustments to their practice when students are not learning. Six, proficient. Evaluation, ensures effective and timely supervision and evaluation of all staff in alignment with state regulations and contract provisions. One, unsatisfactory, four, proficient. Data, informed decisions making. Use, uses multiple sources of evidence related to student learning, including state, district, and school assessment results and growth data to inform school and district goals and improve organizational performance, educator effectiveness, and student learning. Six proficient, one exemplary. And the overall uh, rating for this uh, first part was seven proficient. This time I would invite any comment. Mm -hmm. this, Mr. Pierce? Yeah, I believe Dr. Bodie makes her decisions with the use of data, and I think Dr. Chesson and her team help her in this regard. I'm unsure whether all staff have been effectively and timely supervised and evaluated. I'm sure this is going to be an ongoing process, and there'll be some kinks in the system to work out. For example, I do not believe all the principals feel they have enough time in their day to get their work done and to properly evaluate and supervise. More work needs to be done here. Mr. Schlickman? Uh, based on the evidence before the committee, the development and implementation of curriculum consistent with the Common Core Standards has been done in a strategic manner. The district used assessment data to align resources, both financial and staff time, to the perceived needs of the district. In a relationship with the school committee, the superintendent has made a considerable effort at providing the committee with actionable data. There's no evidence available to rate the superintendent on 
uh, 1D evaluations as evaluations are not made available to the committee, that, which is why I did not rate that item. Um, I recommend in the coming year that we hear more about curriculum, instruction, assessment, and evaluations as they are described here. Um, I recommend more emphasis on evaluation of any pilot programs and reporting out of results. Evaluation systems need to be built into the rollout of new programs. They need to involve teachers who are not involved in the pilot but who will be involved if the program is, ex is expanded. An example of this would be the tools of the mind. and. Um, I feel some improvements could have been made with that. Um, finally, I recommend that the Arlington Public Schools create and maintain better data to, that capture in numbers various aspects of our students' life, especially in middle and high schools, not just supplying them at the school committee request. Examples of these include class sizes, number of students um, addressed by the number of students that each teacher is responsible for, and just numerics that help us when we're talking about what resources are needed at the school and what improvements need to be made. That's all. I commend the superintendent and the entire staff for the diligence in dealing with the state mandates regarding assessment. I'm impressed with the leadership and staff in using their assessments and analyzing and developing programs. I recommend that all information regarding evaluations of teachers and all administrators be reported to the Department of Elementary, Secondary Education in a timely manner. Is there anyone else? Okay. This time, uh, I will be reading uh, Superintendent's Performance Rating for Standard 2, Management and Operations. Environment develops and executes effective plans, procedures, routines, and operational systems to address a full range of safety, health, and emotional and social needs. Four needs improvement, three proficient. Human Resources Management and Development implements a cohesive approach to recruiting, hiring, induction, development, and career growth that promotes high quality and effective practice. One needs improvement, four proficient, one exemplary. Scheduling and Management Information Systems uses systems to ensure optimal use of data and time for teaching, learning, and collaboration, minimizing disruptions and distractions for school level staff, five proficient. Law, ethics, and policies understands and compiles, excuse me, and complies with state and federal laws, mandates, school committee policies, collective bargaining agreements, and ethical guidelines. One needs improvement, five proficient, one exemplary. Fiscal systems develops a budget that supports the district's visions, missions, and goals, allocates and manages ex expenditures consistent with district and school level goals and available resources. Six proficient, one exemplary. Overall rating, one needs improvement, six proficient. This time, I will invite members of the committee to make any comment. I gave the superintendent proficient uh, in all but one. I gave her exemplary under law, ethics, and policy, so I wanted to point that out. My experience with Superintendent Bodie over the past six years has been that she has an exemplary understanding of state and federal laws and mandates, school committee policies, collective bargaining agreements, and ethical guidelines. Her 15 years of experience on the Winchester School Committee, coupled with 15 years in administrative roles in our district, makes her one of the more experienced superintendents in the state in terms of law, ethics, and policies. Okay. Mr. Pierce? Just briefly, Mr. Chair, I just noticed that there was one um, mistake on mine that what didn't get implemented into the cohesive one is um, on 2E fiscal systems. I actually rated these improvement not proficient, not exemplary. So, okay, uh, I will make I'll make that change. So it should come out, or on is this two e two e two e? So it would read. Oh yeah, we don't know if his was the exemplary or one of the proficient. I'd just like to explain that. Go right ahead. Okay, because I did rate uh, Dr. Bodie uh, proficient every other category under this um, uh, standard. Um, with regard to the fiscal systems, I'm disappointed, uh, obviously, as we all probably are, that the district went over budget uh, last year by over $800,000. And while I understand the volatility of special education spending, more must be done during the year to control costs or budget more appropriately. Also, we're not allocating appropriately for the huge spikes in enrollment growth. We've been seeing our reserve teachers deployed even before the summer months come along. Having said that, and I concur with Mr. Thielman, Dr. Bodie impresses me with her ability to set a proper tone and environment for continuous learning in the district. 
She regularly addresses new state law topics with the school committee and keeps us informed about human right. resources hiring and operational decisions. Mr. Schlickman. Yes, thank you. The district's operations are viewed with respect by the community. In observing the annual school budget presentation before the Finance Committee, it is obvious the FinCom has respect for the operations of the system. The clarity of our budget presentation to the FinCom and the background work to make the case for our expanded needs to increase enrollment led to an adjustment to the formula used to determine the town's appropriation to the schools. The lack of direct communication following the Stratton gun license incident was a significant lapse in the routines and systems, standard 2A, and the committee has been working with the superintendent to rectify the problem. It's essential that the school committee members, parents, and other stakeholders are alerted of items of concern before reading about them in the local media. Overall proficient. Yes. yes. Um, I commend the superintendent on fostering an environment where our teacher mentor program is cited in the state as number one. I commend the superintendent on recruitment of a new special education director, our new principals, and a diverse staff. And both of those led to my um, exemplary rating in 2B. Um, I commend the superintendent on her suggestion last year at Long Range Planning of giving the Arlington Public Schools a larger amount in 2015. 2014 in addition to changing the formula um, for growth in the student enrollment. I think that was kind of a breakthrough thought that didn't come from anywhere else. I recommend improvements be continue to be made in communication systems such as those needed during the incident in Stratton last year. I recommend that more um, I recommend that more attention be paid to facilities management and facilities issues such as the Hardy Playground, especially safety issues, so that concerns raised are always checked out and corrected if necessary. I recommend better collection of ongoing problems, analysis, and presentation of information. And both of those items led me to do a needs improvement under 2A. And then finally, I commend the creation of a long-range projection tool and recommend that it be used more during discussions, during budget discussions with the town and offhand I note that it was actually used this morning. Mm. Um, so that was great. Um, and then I had inadequate information to respond to 2C. Well said. Going on to superintendent's performance rating for standard three, family and community engagement. Engagement actively ensures that all families are welcome members of the classroom and school community and can contribute to the effectiveness of the classroom, school, district, and community. <coughs> Seven, proficient. Sharing responsibility continuously collaborates with families and community stakeholders to support student learning and development at home, school, and in the community. Three, needs improvement. Four, proficient. Communication engages in regular two-way culturally proficient communication with families and community stakeholders about student learning and performance. One needs improvement, six proficient. Family concerns addresses family and community concerns in an equitable, effective, and efficient manner. Four needs improvement, three proficient. Overall, seven proficient. This time, any members? Go ahead. Um, so this is an area that had been more of a problem, and I think there's been a lot of improvement in recent years. Um, the monthly newsletter is clearly a valuable source of information for many families. Um, where I think improvement is needed in creating is in creating sort of a regular forum whereby families can communicate their thoughts and concerns. And in a way that doesn't necessarily need to be just to the superintendent, there could be layers of structures of, you know, at the principal level, or at the school level, or um, to an administrator that handles this particular kind of problem, but just sort of creating um, pathways that parents can express concerns um, is, I think, needed, especially as our district becomes larger. Um, it it's, it's, would be unfair for one person to handle sort of all inquiries. Anyone else? I have. Mr. Slickman? Yeah. Uh, as chair of the Community Relations Subcommittee, I know that Superintendent Bodie is committed to a high level of communication with the parents and community members of Arlington. The superintendent spends considerable time and energy in the communication process, including a very extensive newsletter and a plethora of email lists for parents and community members. 
Arlington has a substantial population of second language learners with more than 11% of our students with a first language other than English. This is a highly diverse population and our families speak a considerable range of languages and are from many diverse cultures. It is not apparent from the evidence that's before us that communication with second language families meets the needs of these families. I commend the superintendent on her newsletters which highlight the accomplishments of Arlington students and teachers. I commend the superintendent on personally attending so many school events and meetings showing parents, students, and teachers a high level of caring. I recommend that the student work hard to, harder to hear the emotional content behind parent complaints and to rep respond to this content, for example, as seen in the Tools of the Mind concerns last year. And that led me to, um, that in other stuff led me to write to 3D family concerns as needs improvement. Um, I recommend that the stu superintendent better involves parents in wide-reaching changes such as adopting the online park exam by providing more information and having better outreach and also that she solicit and respond to their concerns about testing. And these items led me to rank um, to th uh, 3B as needs improvement. Um, and finally, I recommend that the superintendent make available to parents and the public the new Ar Arlington Public Schools curriculum map, at least in some sort of summary form. Well said. Superintendent's performance rating for standard four, professional culture. Commitment to high standards fosters a shared commitment to high standards of service, teaching, and learning with high expectations for achievement for all. Five proficient, two exemplary. Cultural proficiency ensures that policies and practice enable staff members and students to interact effectively in a culturally diverse environment in which students' backgrounds, identity, strengths, and challenges are respected. One needs improvement, five proficient. Communications demonstrates strong interpersonal, written, and verbal communication skills, seven proficient. Continuous learning develops and nurtures a cultural culture in which staff members are reflective about their practice and use use student data, current research, best practices, and theory to continuously adapt practice and achieve improved results. Models these behaviors in his or her own practice. Five proficient, two exemplary. Shared vision successfully and continuously engages all stakeholders in the creation of a shared educational vision in which every student is prepared to succeed in post-secondary education and become a responsible citizen and global contributor. One needs improvement, five proficient, one exemplary. Managing conflict. Employ strategies for responding to disagreement and dissent, constructively resolving conflict and building consensus throughout a district school community. One needs improvement, five proficient, one exemplary. I'll invite the committee to make any comments. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, I commend the superintendent on the continued push, on continuing to push for a more diverse island of staff that better resembles that better represents a diverse student population. I commend her on her collaborative approach. I recommend that the superintendent work to ensure that school committee members are better informed of emerging issues that involve our schools, such as the Stratton incident, so we may help address and perhaps assuage community concerns. And I recommend that the superintendent work with all stakeholders on the creation of a shared educational vision I feel we don't have this now, and it would be very useful in building community support for the schools. And I, that's why I wrote needs improvement for 4E. For e. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Hammond? Yes, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, I rated 4A, 4D, 4E, and 4F exemplary. Uh, the superintendent is to be commended for adopting challenging goals for student performance using her goals and the district goals as the basis for encouraging the professional staff to reach for high standards. It is evident that the superintendent has developed a collaborative relationship with the AEA leadership and the frequent and respectful communication has enabled us to implement the new evaluation system to transition to the Common Core and to have support for the transition to PARC. Uh, superintendent Bodie's strength is in managing conflict in promoting a shared vision as she has been a calming and supportive leader for our schools. Yes. I read 4A exemplary. 
<clears throat> the superintendent and her staff are committed to high standards throughout the district. In a good way, they are competitive with other districts. They seek to be ahead of the curve on curriculum and instruction improvements. The technology initiative, the variety of professional development we offer, and the superintendent's constant presence in classrooms and schools are indications of a district that has high standards. An example of Dr. Bodie's com commitment to high standards is that a year or so ago, she was invited to present at the joint MASS-MASC conference on the district's work on district determined measures, which were in place before the state mandated them to be. In addition, it's worth noting that among high-performing districts, we spend less per pupil than most, which means the superintendent does a superior job of maximizing relatively limited resources to impact student learning. Based on my experience interacting with superintendents around the state, Arlington has one of the state's most qualified and competent superintendents. I commend the superintendent for setting and demanding the highest standards in our teaching staff and students. I, I recommend cultural proficiency needs to be made a very high priority for our staff at all levels. I believe that it will increase the level of achievement with our minority students. I recommend that all management staff become involved in evaluating how disagreement and dissent are dealt with when issues of curriculum are discussed. And at this time, I must confess, I've lost a piece of the compiled. It's the top cover sheet. So I need to ask, do you have a copy of it, mm -hmm. the compilation? I'm sorry. I have it on my computer. You have the It's in Novus. Thank you. Uh, aren't, aren't, thank you. Yes, he has no no. At this time, the final um, rating uh, for the superintendent under professional practice goals was one significant progress, four met, and two exceeded. Student learning goals, one some progress, six significant progress. And district improvement goals, four significant progress, three met. The overall rating from the Arlington School Committee was seven proficient. Yes. Do we have a chance to just make? Yeah, absolutely. I was just yeah, <coughs> closing statements. Anyone that cares to. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm I'm just gonna relax now that I I've done one of the things that I don't like doing that much, but I also honor and cherish and appreciate having the opportunity to do. And I want to thank you, Dr. Bodie. Uh, very much for your continued leadership here in Arlington. Mm -hmm. um, I find it strangely ironic that on our tables tonight we have this book that you were kind enough to bring back for us, Mr. Chair, Ms. Dr. Bodie. Thanks for the feedback mm -hmm. uh, when we're giving feedback and taking feedback tonight. So I think mm -hmm. just uh, to quote from uh, the first page in that book, I thought it was very clever. Um, the author writes, before you tell me how to do it better, before you lay out your big plans for changing, fixing, and improving me, before you teach me how to pick myself up and dust myself off so that I can be shiny and successful, know this, I've heard it before. I've been graded, rated, and ranked, coached, screened, and scored. I've been picked first, picked last, and not picked at all. And that was just kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Fody, um, I, I, again, I, I want to just sum up to say thank you very much. I appreciate what you've done for this district. And, and I wrote here in one of my comments that I left for, for just now that I, I feel that you've grown in your leadership and management style since I've known you and been on this committee for four plus years. Uh, I see that in the staff who seem pleased with the direction the district is going in and are happy that you've made trips into their classrooms so often to observe them and their practice and give feedback to them. Um, you know, there are certain things that we pointed around this table um, that we don't need to go, or I don't need to go into or delve into again, and I'm, I'm glad to talk mm -hmm. with you about m my report um, more, in more detail, but uh, I think you've been able to manage contentious in issues and manage them adeptly, and, and, and um, I just, again, thank you for your leadership and um, hope to do this again next year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or not. <laughs> I, I don't know what I hope it goes easier for me. Anyone else? Mr. Schlick. Yeah, uh, just uh, as a preface, I want to note that in evaluating the professional practice, student learning, and district improvement goals, I think the best rating possible is significant progress because if we meet the goals and we do it too easily, we, we set a goal that was too easy. Uh, and I think the goals that we set 
were challenging, and uh, I rated two of them significant progress, and I think that that's probably the most commendable thing that you can do with these kind of goals. I, I just wanted to give that context. Uh, in general, Superintendent Bodie's calm and steady leadership style has been a good match for the district. She has developed excellent working relationships with the leadership of the teachers union as well as the leadership of the town to be a credible leader for strategic incremental change. She has carefully crafted the argument for a new Arlington High School, probably the largest challenge on the horizon. She has successfully communicated the needs and challenges pertaining to the increasing enrollment in our schools and has worked with town leaders to obtain funding to support the additional students in our schools. The schools continue to have strengths beyond those measured by standardized tests. The fine arts program, including music, is a source of excellence and pride in our schools. Our athletic program continues to have a high rate of participation despite the fees imposed upon it by the school committee. With regard to the accountability measures and indicators, the movement of Arlington High to level one status is a major achievement. There are also uh, considerable signs of improvement in instruction at the middle school level. There is concern about some significantly weak scores for high need students at some elementary schools, and that requires urgent and strategic attention, which I believe is happening. Uh, the superintendent's ability to engage in open and honest communication in a common, non judgmental manner is an important part of her success. She always endeavors to answer questions of the committee in a candid and thorough manner, which greatly assists the committee's work as a part time board of directors for the district. I have confidence when I vote on a matter before the committee, I have before me the full and impartial information required to cast a thoughtful vote. I value her counsel and opinion, and I am pleased to rate her as proficient. Um, I commend the superintendent on her continued work and dedication to the schools and on her collaborative approach. I think that both of these have really contributed to our schools moving up a level. I've mentioned things that I think need improving because I think our students deserve the best that we can give them. And if we don't point out areas that need improvement, they're not going to get fixed. So um, I just wanted to echo again that mm -hmm. I really appreciate your hard work and dedication. Well said. Well said. I commend the superintendent to the school committee for having to deal with me for the past seven months. <laughs> She's still alive. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we don't always agree, but I've always found the superintendent willing to talk and discuss, and uh, she's helped me keep my cool, which I, th I commend her for that as well. Thank you very much. Do you have anything you'd like to say at this time, or she want to move on? Just a couple comments. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the, some of the kind words that you, you've offered. I appreciate that, because it, it is a hard job. Um, As we have begun this new uh, evaluation system in Arlington, one of the things that we have talked about with all of our staff um, is that this is a, an opportunity for continuous improvement. Un unfortunately, I think I get the, the jackpot of having to do it on camera, but uh, it is a process and there's things that, that clearly need to be improved. But I think anybody listening to this list of competencies that you have to uh, you know be good at everything realize that there are going to be areas that need to be improved so I appreciate uh, and I wrote some notes down of, of areas that um, that I actually agree with in terms of things that need to improve um, but I but I have to say that um, you know a, a superintendent doesn't do this work by themselves and what is key to the great achievements that we're seeing and the progress is really such a strong team, which is some of whom you are here, but um, many that are not here tonight, there are principals, other administrators, and, and teachers that we have. Arlington, I hope, understands and appreciates what a great um, group of people that are, are taking care of their children and leading them to um, learning all that they need to learn and um, really making, growing at, at their highest potential. And it, it's a very caring group of people and very competent group of people. And I, and I 
I just want to acknowledge that because it's not one person ever. It's it's a whole team of people, and that's the that's the key. And and I feel that we have a good team teaming relationship here because it it how we model it is how it goes also, you know, throughout the whole system, and that's really important. Um, so I. We will begin this process, and I, and I do agree. We need to get a little bit more clarity how we're going to do evidence. We've we've mm -hmm. done it before in a different way, and I, I, I just it's a growing process in how we adapt to the, the the way we want to do it for the state. I would like to uh, also uh, remind the committee that any notes taken during this time are now part of the public record. You need to turn those in. Uh, if you've got them electronically, get them to uh, Karen, Ms. Fitzgerald, as soon as possible. Uh, if you've got them handwritten, I will personally give that correction that had to be made. I'm sure she's already got it. I sent you another correction. Yes. I just sent you another correction on email. Okay, fine. Okay. Uh, I would also uh, echo Dr. Buddy. We're going to start the the goals process in the next week. To she and I are going to meet, and then we're going to have a subcommittee meeting, probably right after Thanksgiving, on superintendent evaluation to start that, seeking from the subcommittee to the full board input on evidence so that we get a head start on it. Mm -hmm. I'd ask the other members, uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer, you weren't with us, but we've come a long way in the past three years just in the system, I think. Uh, and I, I think tonight was process-wise the best other than me screwing up at the end. So moving on to the superintendent's wait, report. Wait, wait, oh, wait. sorry. Is, can we at some point talk about the this, I mean, not, not our evaluation, but the instrument and how we can adapt it okay, for, I, I, I mean, how, how people might like to have it adapted okay, I will, or clarified or, and things. Going with that, mm -hmm. I will inquire from Desi if we have the option to adapt. I think we do. I think we do. I think we do. I think we can do whatever we I, want. I, I don't want us to do any work and be told afterwards we can't. Okay. I'll, just, I'll just verify. Okay. Quick question, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair. Uh, Superintendent Evaluation Subcommittee. Do we have a date on Monday, no. December 1st? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That'll be the first meeting of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, who's on it again? Me. Hi. Me. You. And, mm -hmm. and just Cindy. Okay. But a, anyone all are welcome to come as usual. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. Let me make sure I have it on my calendar. <laughs> We set this quite a while back. Mm -hmm. yeah, probably. Is there. Yeah. I think when we began to set up the process for this, right. we all felt the need that we needed. Mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure it's set. We all set now? Mm -hmm. Superintendent's report. All right. Um, I have oh, a couple Sarah. of things. Um, but before I begin with um, the one that's actually bulleted on the agenda, I didn't expect to have to be talking about snow on November 13th, um, but I do. Um, we are going to have, we're, we're, we're supposed to have snow overnight, and I think it, it's important to say at the beginning of the season is that these, these decisions, and I don't expect a, uh, by the way, I do not expect a snow day tomorrow, but it's just the beginning of this process, and who knows what we're going to see. But um, these decisions are made in the at a very early time in the morning and sometimes we just simply can't predict exactly how things the weather could change at 7 30 and buddy's walking out of their house so because the decisions need to be made as early as five because of buses mm -hmm. but parents also need to know if in their judgment it is too dangerous to be leaving they just need to let the school know that they're going to be delayed mm -hmm. or if if they can't feel that they can get out at all, that they need to just let the school know. Mm -hmm. um, so when we have those kind of really iffy, difficult days, um, it can be um, an excused. It, it's an it, it still is an ex, an ex absence, but it can be an excused absence. All right. Um, I don't know if we can zoom that a little bit better, but I, what I wanted to do tonight is to to give up a, a response to um, information that was talked about by uh, Dr. Stephen Harrington at the last meeting about uh, our ratios of out of district, uh, not say out of district, but out of school suspensions and in school suspensions, but mainly focusing on out-of-school suspensions. Um, 
the concern was expressed is that we had a disproportionate number of, of black and um, uh, black, uh, um, black black to white ratio in terms of in terms of out of, st out of school suspensions. So after that evening, I asked for the report and went through it very carefully and did find what was an obvious error, it was pretty obvious that in, there was two different charts. It's a fairly long report, I might tell you. It's, it, it includes information about the number of students taking Algebra one and how it's distributed among all of the different groups mm -hmm. as well. And this is AP courses. It's a very involved and time-consuming report. But there is, there is a chart that says the number of out-of-district Sorry, out of district is just sort of one of those words that comes out so quickly in, in uh, with Ron's special ed. But it's out of school suspensions for students with disabilities and for students without disabilities. And what I could see is that the, the two charts had identical numbers. I didn't know at the time which, which of those two numbers were actually correct. So we did look into the data for 11-12 and that was a mistake. Um, it was just an oversight in terms of the data that was um, there. Um, so when we looked at the act, taking it student by student, looking at the number of out of school suspensions, we actually found that we had a <coughs> slightly higher number than we had reported. The report that had been submitted said there were 96. Now, one thing I, I do want to stress before I go into any more detail about this is that we're talking about a very small sample of students. And when you have a small sample, and those of you who know statistics, it, it's not very difficult for a, a, a change of a few to really change the ratios and proportions because it's, su it's super sensitive to small changes. So. When we looked at the actual numbers, um, it does change the ratios uh, uh, of number of black students to white students that have been out on, on suspensions. I look at the data a little bit differently than Dr. Harrington, but it's a sort of a different lens to the same issue. When I look at, so for example, and you have this in your packet, but I hopefully people up that are at home can see this. The change was that with the 111 students, uh, 111 incidents, there were 66 uh, white students, 19 black students. In contrast to what was reported, there was 45 white students and 23 black students, which would almost suggest that that is really disproportionate. How I look at it is this. In this total population in 11-12, 3.6% of our students are black students under the category that we use for the federal, federal reporting. If you were to take that percent of the 111, you would expect that if, if the number of out of school suspensions mimicked in the same proportion as the actual distribution of the population, you would expect that same kind of distribution in the number of out of school. So that would, would have us expect four black students being in an out of school suspension. And in fact, there were 19. So it was five times greater than what we would expect. When the data had been reported, it actually was more like 6.5 times greater. So it was slightly improving, but still of concern. And looking at that, when you look at the number of white students in 11-12, which was 77.2% of the total enrollment of the 111, you would expect 86 of the 111 to be the number of stu white students. And in fact, there were 66, so there were less. So it was less than expected. Now, to put this in context, that was a time period um, where we were 
having a lot of concerns about students that were coming in from group homes, and not only group homes, but other students who were coming in that were struggling with the transition into the high school. Because uh, most of these suspensions are at the high school level. It doesn't mean that there aren't suspensions at the elementary or the middle school. There are, but, but the, 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 the majority of them are at the high school. And it was, a, it was about that time um, that we began looking at programs and supports for these students in order to have a better transition into the high school. And uh, we did the same thing at the middle school as well, but more so even at the high school. And so when I look at the data for 13-14, this report is submitted every two years. And so we're, we'll be submitting it late December, early January. So these are very preliminary numbers. This is a very time consuming process. But what, when I look at the 13-14 data, which you have also, one of the things that is very notable is that we've gone from 111 to 55 total for one year. And in looking at that, the, the, the breakout was, we're just talking about these two particular categories. There were 36 white students and 10 black students. Our enrollment has grown over that period of time. Um, but the relative ratio percentages haven't changed a lot, but a little bit. And so, for example, um, for black students, it has changed to being 3.7 six percent of the total enrollment. So if you take that number times 55, you're going to have an expectation of four students. We had 10. So what you're seeing is definitely a change in the ratios, which is what exactly what we wanted to see happen. The same thing for white students. When we look at, we had 74.4 percent of the 55 the expected number would be 40, and we had 36. So we're now having, we're seeing a, a, a more of a parity there. But I think that, that um, what is very compelling and, um, and, and reassuring, actually, is that the, the kind of programmatic supports that we're putting in is having the kind of effect that we want to have. Not only has the total number of, um, uh, out of school suspensions changed, but the relative ratios are also changing. So that's the good news. Um, I, I have um, been in consultation with um, our town council about what's the process to resubmit the data, and he has talked to the um, Office of Civil Rights, and they suggested that we just send in the corrected report when we send in the one for 1314, which is what we will do. Um, so I think that it also speaks to, I think that we have to build in a process where n none of these reports go out without at least another a set of eyes, two sets, looking at them just to see for obvious errors, because that was an obvious error when you actually looked at the report. So it was a good exercise f to go through, um, and I think it's, it's definitely a concern, and I, and I appreciate Dr. Harrington bringing it to our attention. Um, it's certainly been a concern when I've, I've talked to the high school principal about it, and I know that this has been on their minds for quite some time. And certainly on the deans, which even precede uh, Dr. Janger, it has been on their minds in terms of how we support these students and also at the same time have a very, um, you know, the, the appropriate consequences and, th and, and have a smooth, um, day at the high school. And I think that there, that is all improving. So I'm hoping as we see the next report two years out, we're going to even see more improvement as we go forward. Any, yes. oh, just for clarification, I don't think you told the viewing audience at home where these reports are coming from. Um, you told us in the email, it's the civil rights. This is a report. Um, that we have to send to the Office of, well, it's the, Department of the, it's the Department of Justice, and it's their Office of Civil Rights. And it's a very 
long and involved report that is given. It's probably why they do it every two years because it does. It is so time consuming. And, and for example, um, this is the report. There are categories for AP exams. You go through your AP exams and you have to break it out by how many white students, Asian students, black students, Hispanic ta are taking AP, AP and what their scores are. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's very involved report. Um, so this goes, this goes to the federal government and it is posted on their website. Okay. And all school, all school districts do this? Yes. This is done nationally. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so the data where we're talking about the nationally, um, what the number of that, that black students are three times more likely to be in an out of school suspension comes from this, mm -hmm. this database. And it is that represents an, a national. So if, when we're saying that ours is higher than that, that is a concern and so we need to look <coughs> at it. But it, it is also um, it also a situation where Arlington hosts a number of group homes, and I think that we have done a better and better job every year of helping um, our, these students adjust to uh, Arlington High School. Do, do we keep records of the reason for suspension? Of course. And is that something that you look at? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. It, every, everything is logged, it's, and, and actually it was very complete data. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, quick questions. What if uh, a student is of multiracial background? How are is he or she? That's actually a very, an excellent question, and that's one that has been um, increasingly of issue in terms of the categories. Um, right now, you just sort of select one of the others, but we don't have a multiracial, and people have talked about that needing to be more a category as we go into the future. Oh. Yeah. And, and I know Mr. Schlickman probably mm. has some thoughts yeah. on that one too. Yeah, and the other yeah. question I had real quickly is the, is the designation um, in this uh, preliminary data sheet of out of school suspensions only one or more than one? Do you mean only one day or more than one day? It says annual report mm. for a whole school year. Okay. So we had in the 13-14 in the school year, our preliminary number said we had only 55 district-wide. No, no, no. Just the, oh. um, it says only one. Or oh, four. oh, oh. I see. They, they asked. We have to break it out that way. How many students had only one? Um, a suspension oh, oh, and not day. Okay. not day suspension it's not the number of days you don't get that in the report at all so somebody might have a two day five day ten day um, but the other one where it's more than one is it's students who get multiple in the same year in the same year okay. and what you will see which is interesting in the data is that there's noticeably fewer students um, that have a, only one day, I mean only one instance. Most of the time, the majority of the students involved in out-of-school suspensions have more than one. Mr. Schleckman? Yeah, I, just because I've been on the business end of compiling this report, fortunately I haven't had to do the task, but I've been involved in help, sort of helping out and overseeing it. This is a very complicated report to produce. And it doesn't align to the way we report in Massachusetts because we do have uh, 64 different racial categories we can do when, when reporting to the state because uh, you are allowed to check multiple boxes and it's reported back that way, but the feds bring it back down to, to a different set, of category, uh, different set of categories. And a lot of things that, w how we report in Massachusetts doesn't align to what we're doing. And instead of reporting this electronically where we can go and hit a button and get a report, uh, for the most part there's a lot of hand labor in terms of doing the research and figuring out what's going on in order to fill into the category. So there's a lot of cutting and pasting and a lot of room for error in this. So it's totally understandable that uh, in, in preparing this report, uh, because we don't have a dedicated staff to comply with federal reports that take a lot of time, people have to do that in addition to their regular duties. It's, it, it's, it's, it's an onerous process, and I just wanted to make that comment. 
uh, I appreciate the fact that we uh, we looked into the data, we've clarified it, and it, it's such uh, viewing what the true data is is unsatisfactory, and we're working towards uh, aligning it to better reflect our, our student population. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to say that. Um, that as you all know, this is a national issue in which national attention is being put onto, and, I, and mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's a really good thing. I mean, I think it's a good thing that nationally we're asking these questions. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and I have faith that Arlington is, is taking this seriously and, mm -hmm. and will work towards making sure that mm -hmm. the same kind of offenses get the same kind of mm -hmm. consequence, and it's not divisive. Mm -hmm. I do. I want to recognize those kids. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, actually, the next um, two, I wanted to ask uh, Laura Chesson if she would just give a, um, a quick update on our professional day as well as the data that just came out on evaluations on the DESE website. Um, uh, on the election day, we had a professional day for the entire staff. Um, including teaching assistants, um, related service providers, as well as teaching staff. Um, the morning was a required session based on the individual needs of the departments and um, the grade levels. So uh, at the elementary level, um, many of the staff and the lower levels attended uh, workshops on math and math discourse. Um, and uh, at the upper levels had professional learning time for them, their PLC work. Uh, in the later part of the morning and in the afternoon, uh, teachers were able to choose from a variety of 30 workshops, the vast majority of which were offered by uh, teachers, their colleagues, and other related service providers within um, the school. Every and we have everything from things that had to do with um, the affective domain, with cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as dealing with students with stress, um, to dealing with academic issues, um, such as uh, meeting the needs of all students, utilizing assistive technology, um, utilizing technology as a formative assessment, and communicating with parents using uh, social media. Um, and uh, we have looked, begun to look at the data from that, and the vast majority of those who uh, responded to the survey, we got about 120 responses. Um, with, with some minor exceptions, people um, uh, said, stated that they strongly agreed or agreed that um, it was a meaningful day for them and the delivery method of the workshop was uh, good for them. Um, so I, I want to thank everybody, particularly the people that sort of stepped out to uh, deliver the workshops because without that we would not have been able to have our day. Can I make a comment on that? Sure. I think one of the things that really um, should be noted and two things well anyway Laura did a great job of encouraging a lot of teachers to present I, I think that this is one of the strengths of Arlington that is should not be um, just sort of taken granted we have such competent teachers that the other, their peers learn from them um, not that we are adverse to bringing in outside experts we do in fact we had um, Jessica, Jessica Minahan, Minahan come and, and give a workshop actually three different times during the day but all of these choice workshops were conducted by our own teachers and we're hearing that they really the teachers that attended them learned a lot and I have to say not all districts do this and I really have to commend our teachers because they're willing to do it and they really offer such wonderful uh, opportunities for their colleagues um, the second thing that I just wanted to comment very briefly on um, was at this time the Department of uh, Elementary and Secondary Education has released some data regarding um, educator evaluation. Um, I, I just want to clarify something that might be difficult to understand by looking at that report. Um, we are not we are not a race to the top district, and so therefore last year we were required to report to the state electronically at 50, a minimum of 50 percent of our teacher evaluations. Um, so when one would read the report, one might assume that the, the teachers that are not reported, and by the way, we were higher than 50%, um, but you might assume that they were not evaluated and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, we 
uh, had all of our teachers in the teacher of, uh, electronic teacher evaluation system and sent, sent that up mm -hmm. through the, what's called the EPIM system to the state. Um, but there were some teachers that were either out on maternity leave at the beginning of the year or the middle of the year or the end of the year. Those teachers were not within the system long enough to have, in many cases, to have an overall rating. And so that their um, evaluation, although they did have observations and evaluations done, their final rating was not reported to the state. Um, in addition, there was not a requirement um, to report um, administrators last year for non-race to the top districts. Uh, we uh, did not resolve our uh, what we call our AAA administrator contract uh, until very late in the year, and so the previous evaluation system was in place, and so therefore they, many of them did not, uh, they were all evaluated, but if they were required to by their contract, um, but many of them did not have an electronic transmission of their evaluation. So I just want to um, state that. And, and the one final thing I want to state to the public is that if, if you look at the data, the DESE has made an acknowledgment that a teacher's uh, individual evaluation rating is, or an educator's evaluation rating is considered confidential. So if there, were, if there was an ability to determine what an individual person's evaluation rating would be by the data that is given to the public, then that um, data is embargoed. So if, for example, 100% of a school was to receive a proficient rating, then you would know that everybody had a proficient rating so you would know in fact what people's rating was and so that information is embargoed so it's it's quite complex and i'm sure we'll be talking about it more but i just wanted to initially say that if you looked at the at the report you may conclude that some people were not evaluated and everyone that was required to be evaluated was evaluated last year when will the state require everyone to be up on the uh, electronically this time this year we have to transmit everything so june by june 30th. Yeah, they actually, we submit I'm, the I'm data. I'm not saying that they'd be submitted, right. but the things would have to be completed and be ready to go. Absolutely. And the, right. First. And then they send us information and we levels? double check that at all levels. Yeah. At all levels. Yep. Okay. I do want to also mention one other thing is that our agreement with the AEA as we, as we learning this new system is that we're not um, having anybody rated exemplary. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that we don't think that we have exemplary teachers. Um, we do. But we're, we're not doing that. We're, we're not going to do it again this year either. Um, and we're we in further discussions as to how we move forward. Uh, but so, so when you look at that, you say, Sarlington, the, the ones that we turn in, no, there's no exemplary. Well, that, I just want you to know that was a very conscious thing. If you go through that whole list, I spent about an hour this afternoon, very, very few schools are actually bringing out exemplary. Most, 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 most schools are doing very much what we're doing yeah. on this because like this. All right, I, I did think I had one more thing. I'm hold oh, this is just important. We have done a parent survey, as you know, and the, the, it's going to close the end of the day on November 16th. I will send out a reminder to parents. So if anyone's listening at this point, would you please uh, complete the survey? It's going to be helpful information to us. You may complete the survey for um, each child. Actually, what the re request is, if you have two children in the same school, do, a, do it for the school. But if you have a child in a children in two different schools or even three different schools, you can feel free to do three different surveys. We, uh, I managed to skip public participation. I noticed we have some guests in the room. I didn't know if you'd like to come up to the microphone, introduce yourselves and why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. Are you, are you gentlemen scouts? Yes. Are you working on a merit badge? <laughs> is it, is it, is it, which one is it? Communications. Communications, okay. <laughs> I don't know if any other members of the board are, have been scouts. I was, and I helped people get communication badges. My emails, there. anything I can do to help you and support you guys, be happy to. Thank you. I know, I, I know how exciting this is for you to be sitting here. <laughs> you earn the badge just for sitting through one of these sessions yeah. <laughs> like that. Okay, uh, 
We are now on the consent agenda. <coughs> Excuse me. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 15051 dated October 23, 2014 in the amount of $769,464.96. Approval of draft minutes September 4th and October 23rd, 2014. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? No discussion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay. Moving on. Let me get back to, to here. Uh, we are now in subcommittee reports. Uh, budget, Ms. Starks. Usually you start with him. Uh, I'm policies. just going by what's listed there. I, I missed policy. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Policy. policy. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Most important subcommittee does usually go first. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Excuse me. If you look at the agenda, the, the thing, the document does not even have you listed. It's right oh, there. It's right here. Not on mine. It's oh, well. It's, uh, it's um, right there. Up at the top. Facing. The old man it's can't funny. see. Thank you. All right. Just we have a couple first readings that we would mm -hmm. like to bring to your attention tonight. Um, we met uh, most recently last evening. Um, the uh, safety policies, uh, EB, uh, which and I'm looking for it. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Let's see. Okay, so on this, uh, on this safety file. program policy, we have uh, I guess just way of categorizing the final sentence in the that. policy mm -hmm. and added to ensure a district wide standard of safety procedures, every member of the faculty and staff will be, will be provided a copy of the district's crisis communication and management mm -hmm. which, as you can see, most most of our classrooms have. We have it here in the school committee room. It's the it's the red book at the front of the mm. front of the room. <laughs> so um, that's basically we've done this to keep up with the um, the change. It used to be with the with with the state law. Um, what's the next? Uh, according to this, this uh, E B C B. <laughs> Fire drills. What does these things stand for? EB. EBCB. What do the file letters what, stand for? Yeah. Is there a they're they're from the um, MASC guide. Um, many districts adopt the letters. Um, they don't. I so think you have can any compare them. Actually, it's a code book that uh, comes from the National, the National School yeah, Boards Association. Yeah. So that uh, you know, not all school districts use these codes, mm. but it is a common set of codes, and they are classified by content area. Fire drills, we added the, the <coughs> statement the district will follow current state regulations on the frequency of fire drills. Emergency. EBCD on emergency. Uh, basically, wordsmithing and crossing out principle to reflect the correct spelling of principles. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dismiss schools early in the event of hazardous weather and top of the top of mm -hmm. the page. And um, I see. at the very bottom, we crossed out that old sentence, which doesn't apply anymore when schools are closed for emergency reasons. Staff members shall comply with the school committee policy and reporting for work. Hmm. There's no school committee should policy. The, I think the word <laughs> ones should be deleted after principles. No? Yeah. Hmm. Following Where? principles, ones relating. Follow Did we, including we the following mm. principles. Relating yeah, to, so we should ones. note that ones right after the new right. principles. And then this uh, last one, which I got in just the very nick of time today. Thank you, Karen. Um, we went over last night, uh, has to do with our agenda format and preparation and dissemination. Um, as you know, we've gone to this um, mm -hmm. new system through Novus Agenda, mm -hmm. where we can see it on our screens and we get the submissions electronically. We'd like to have that same um, benefit go out to the public. So as part of this change in this policy, we've added on the second page that um, the public shall be able to access all the same documents we see at the meeting at 6.30 p.m. right when the meeting starts. 
mm -hmm. and um, that's when everything will be released to the public. The other additions we put on page one show that um, when we get the packets, two work days no later than 4 p.m. will be when we get all the supporting materials. Question. Not a question. I, and I don't know if, and I defer to the committee, uh, whether it, it belongs on the policy, at what time our secretaries get the material? Well, because we, in yeah. the past, go ahead. We discussed that. We looked at um, Adam's um, mm -hmm. three-page uh, description of what the protocol should be. Mm -hmm. We determined that that would be best left as a protocol rather than a policy statement. Um, my, my only concern with it is that in the past, even when we were de dealing with paper, mm -hmm. Ms. Fitzgerald was getting things as late as the day of. And mm -hmm. what we've been trying to do over the past five, six months, and it's more gone electronic, and I've been guilty of violating it myself, if she will agree, <laughs> uh, of last minute. Emergency things are always going to happen, mm -hmm. and we will get things at last minute. But it's important for the, the superintendent, and the superintendent's been good, and the, the administrative staff and stuff, that if things don't have to be acted upon immediately, if they don't reach, reach Karen by a certain time, they are deferred to a, further, uh, a future meeting. Mm -hmm. now, I'd, I'd be happy. We're going to meet again on December 2nd. I'd be I mean, happy to take up that we can, suggestion. We can wait to see how it works mm -hmm. and, and just mm -hmm. keep it within uh, administrative working. It. But if, if it starts to fail and break down again, I don't know how you folks want it. Yeah, I should we come back to you at that time? Uh, I have nothing to say about that, but okay. there's a typo in here. Okay. <laughs> sure. um, just it says shall be sent to committee yeah. members on the two work days. Doesn't make sense. Okay. Yeah. Scratch up on that. Two proceeding. Just fix it. Work days, I two proceeding. Yeah. I, mean. I think you're just missing a word. Oh, okay. Two work days mm -hmm. preceding the meeting. And then take uh, out on that. Yeah. Prior to. Yeah. Yeah. Prior okay. to whatever. Just, anyway. just, the, just, yeah. just so you yeah. know. That's why we do first readings. Yep. Well said. And also, I think um, the following shall be included yeah. as but not be limited to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of articles in there. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we did, and that's a good point that you brought up. You brought up that paragraph. Um, we did cross out a lot of things that we don't typically do anymore, like the secretary's report. Um, we don't typically have new, new business at our meetings. So, um, so we tried to pair it down mm -hmm. to what our school committee's current school mm -hmm. committee meetings currently look like. Mm -hmm. and, and it shouldn't be teach regular meeting. That's is that right, or what is that? At each. Oh, teach. Yeah. oh each. Ah, at yeah. each. Okay, yeah. <laughs> got I'll it. Get, I'll get on that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But Bill, uh, Mr. Hainer. It's all right. Mr. Chair. I will Whatever. Take up, uh, Dr. Hainer. Dr. Hainer. <laughs> I'll take up your suggestion because Thank you. I, I think we owe it to Karen. Do that. Mm -hmm. hey, I, I, I think it's worked in the mm -hmm. recently. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Even if all you say is that you know everyone will endeavor to get. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. You really want it on this agenda? Get it there on time. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. That's all I have. We're we're going to meet again on December second. I thank my fellow committee members. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, budget, Ms. Starks. Now I'll go. All right. Um, so, uh, budget subcommittee met last night um, to prepare for our presentation. Um, and then we attended this morning's long range planning committee meeting. Um, people need to know that at the last long range planning meeting, there were several um, concerns brought forward about the size of the budget, we'll call it a cliff, I guess, um, when this round of, um, or when this uh, agreement runs out, basically, which is about 2019 right now. Um, not bad for a three-year plan. Yeah, I know. But I I just clarify, it's the town, not mm -hmm. the school budget, right? <laughs> um, what? The town budget, not the school budget. The town budget, yes, I'm sorry, I should have. Uh, so the town budget. And um, so at the last long-range planning meeting, uh, there were lots of scenarios, all of which included cutting school, cutting everybody's budget. <laughs> over the next couple of years. Um, some that cut our budget down to 2.5% um, from the 3.5% that we were getting. Um, anyway, so what we did was we kind of rallied the troops. Um, we had great, we had five speakers, um, Dr. Ampey, Dr. Seuss, uh, Dr. Bodie, um, Diane Johnson, and Linda Hansen all spoke and uh, 
it was great because they had all done different kind mm. of uh, looks and mm -hmm. information about the town. Um, and we went in and we just presented as much information as we could uh, to the Long Range Planning Committee about why we thought this was not the time to cut the Arlington Public Schools. Um, Dr. Bodie spoke on unfunded mandates and kind of all of the, uh, we'll call it race to the top that ha we all have to do, all this uh, mm. rushing to, um, constantly improve that, that the state requires us. Um, Kiersey had done some work looking into um, per pupil costs and comparing ourselves to the town meeting 12 as well as the state. Um, Dr. Seuss had done some work looking at some new census data. Mm -hmm. It was very interesting and showed how demographics in Arlington are changing. Um, Linda Hansen spoke about kind of what the last uh, override agreement had been and uh, kind of where she thought this one should go and and mm -hmm. um, and then Diane of course wrapped us up with actual new enrollment numbers and kind of showing what would happen to the schools if in fact we had to cut our budget so I thought it was great I thought they asked some good questions I think in the end uh, we had them thinking about the fact that that was not a good idea um, and I really want to thank everybody because we kind of had to last minute pull together a meeting and, and decide what we were going to say. And, and I, thought, I thought that it went very well. And I, I just really want to thank everybody mm. for, for doing that. Um, I think it's very important that sometimes, for whatever reason, we are the only ones who speak up for the schools. It's important that we do that. Mm -hmm. um, and our next uh, meeting is on Thursday, December 11th at 3.30. And it will be here. And we have a myriad of topics to discuss. Thanks. Thank you. Community Relations, Mr. Schluckman. Uh, we are charged with uh, making an appointment to the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture. And this is not controversial because we've had one applicant, and in fact, it's a very fine applicant. Uh, Leland Stein is the co-owner of the Regent Theater and has a lifetime of involvement in, in arts and culture. Uh, so uh, I would move that we appoint Leland Stein uh, to the Arlington Commission on Arts and Culture. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. One other, one other thing, uh, which is sort of community relation-ish, although it's sort of Winchester community relation-ish. Uh, my colleague to the left, uh, <laughs> Mr. Pierce, uh, is a thespian, and he is going to play Surge in the production of Art with the Winchester Players. And it's not far to get to Winchester. You can do it in 10 minutes. And uh, tickets are reasonable, $20 each. You can order them on the, their website, winchesterplayers.org. Performances this Friday, Saturday, next Friday, Saturday at 8 p.m. Um, I'm going on Saturday, so uh, I'll be there tomorrow. Okay, so let's 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 get a school committee contingent and support our our, our beloved oh. thespian who's on oh. stage. Do you pay him for this? I, this I commercial? Him. <laughs> Anything? I'm very grateful for. You the need an agent. I mean, there he goes. Okay. It won't be as boring as any of our meetings. So. Please. Oh. <laughs> Do you want to mention 12th night? Curriculum instruction oh, and assessment and accountability, oh. Dr. Ampey. Okay, nothing to report, but I have a question to ask. So I've been approached by a parent who's concerned about the Audison Middle School trips um, this year to going to Florida. Their concern is that there's a lack of funding for low-income students. Um, the trips are voluntarily led by teachers. It's, it's my understanding is it's under the teacher initiative. Um, there were several concerns raised by this parent and my question is I, I think this should be brought up at a subcommittee and discussed but I wasn't actually sure which subcommittee it should go to should it go to budget or should it go to curriculum and I'm on both so it doesn't much matter to me <laughs> I, I just have one question for clarification is this deemed a school sponsored event it's happening during a school vacation a teacher is running it, it uh, there'll the, be a permission process. I wouldn't say that it was school run. Then it's, well, but they, they, it's not, but it's, they did approve it. But, we, uh -oh. but yes. they did approve it mm -hmm. because it's a teacher taking Arlington students. But, and, and I think that that is something that we're, it is worth discussing. Well, I mean, if it, if it is a school, if we are going to discuss it, I think it, it would make it a school event uh, somewhat, maybe, 
quasi. But my understanding is that any event that's in the public arena, if someone cannot afford it, there has to be a way to, for them to uh, attend. I mean, I have no problem going to a subcommittee. Oh, so right. okay. okay, we, we need, it needs to go to the subcommittee because there's, there's discussion and, and this is so. When is this going to take place? The trip? Yeah. Well, We've it's not already, a question of whether or not the trip right. is. We're yeah, not so talking was, about. No, no, okay, no. So I want to know when the trip it's is. It's April vacation. It's April vacation. Oh, fine. So it's not time sensitive. So I, I, I think it should go to curriculum instruction. I'll tell you why. Because it, it really has no implication for our budget. Mm. Right, right. No, this is not mm -hmm. funded. Right. By. It is about money, but it's not yeah. our budget. So I think so. it's a curriculum. Well, <laughs> but it could be. Yes, it could yeah, be. It could be. It could be. switch it over. But then you could kick it over. Okay, that's fine. I think I think you're right. It's it's about access to teachers. It's about Fairness. Well, there's, there's lots mm -hmm. of different yes. things that can Absolutely. be about. So, right. okay, that's uh, fine. I'll so, take them. So, so, Bill, it's been brought to my attention. Twelfth night is playing at the high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we have you. the dates? It's this um, weekend. Is it's this it? weekend, right? So it's Friday and Saturday. Friday and Saturday. Excellent. Seven o'clock. Is that right? Okay, seven o'clock. Seven thirty. Is it seven thirty? Seven. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Whenever it starts, it get there at six thirty. High school play. High school play. Yeah. All set. Facilities. Facilities subcommittee met on October 30th. We had three items on the agenda. The, agenda, the Mononomy Preschool, which uh, there were concerns about um, rodents down uh, in, the, in there, and it's uh, been addressed. The second issue was the Hardy Playground. Um, and so what the, the outcome of that was that uh, 200 cubic yards, we have Diane's left, now 200 cubic yards of uh, chips, wood chips, have been placed at the Hardy Playground to make it safer. Uh, and uh, this, uh, Diane Johnson is working with uh, Mark Miano from the town to set up regular inspections of all of the playgrounds in the town so they're safer. Um, and the superintendent is trying to gather together some funds to make some emergency repairs there. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Well, we're uh, going to assess what we need to, yep. to do there for sure. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you have a chance? I'm, on election day, I noticed that the one, still, that metal piece. Still, still yeah, I haven't gone back. I'll go back tomorrow and check it out. It, it was one of the things they brought up was a yeah. piece of metal sticking out. It was very dangerous, and they had put the wood chips were there the next day. Yeah. I, I want to tell you that and they, were, they were spreading them out the when metal. we were there. But uh, the, there was a piece of metal sticking out that you could. They had duct taped it, but it was still very dangerous. So I'll check it again tomorrow. So, anyway. The third, the third thing we talked about was the overall space planning needs of the district. There were two things that we talked about. One was a long-term plan, and Dr. Bodie and the town manager are going to hire a consultant to do an analysis of our long-term uh, challenges and needs. And then we're going to receive a short-term a report on what will happen next year. Uh, what, what, are the, what are the implications of an increase in enrollment next year on space in the district? Uh, we're going to receive it at a meeting on January 22nd. So there'll be a subcommittee, subcommittee meeting on the 22nd of January. Mm -hmm. Before the school, 5, 5 p.m., I think it is, <laughs> which will be posted very soon. Uh, <clears throat> I think that was a check-in, and then the, check -in, the, right. final yeah. meet, the final report will be presented to the committee in February. Correct, I think. yeah. So okay. we'll have a check-in and then a final report in February. Small correction. We, it hasn't, we haven't actually gone to that next step of doing it, but we're really serious in consider, considering doing a space analysis because... It's, it's very complicated, and, yeah. we, and this is long range and um, in terms of what we need to be able to project in terms of cost. We've talked about, of course, the high school and Stratton, and there's been talk about Minuteman, but um, we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about what, what, is gonna, what are going to be our needs, if we can even anticipate that. That's, that's one of the issues. We knew we were growing, but then we had this sort of unexpected increase and will this be a blip for five years and then level off can we do we need to <coughs> pull somewhere do we need to have um, additions we don't know and so we need some help on this one well, sir. Uh, the chair would like to report two things I attended the uh, CPAC meeting and it went well uh, our new SPED director was there and uh, things it's very positive it's no longer a gripe session. It's, it, things are going forward, and I'm very happy to report that. Uh, I, Dr. Bodie, and Mr. Schlickman, and I'm not, did you, were you able to make it down to the conference on Friday? Uh, for a tiny bit. You were sick. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, okay. Yeah, just for the I, end. I didn't want to leave you up. I, I, I hadn't seen you. Uh, I found, 
I think next year I'm going to look more carefully from my perspective uh, of the whole agenda. There were, uh, I went to, the ones I went to were very good. There were a couple, I was trying to fill the schedule and uh, I didn't quite have enough to fill the schedule. Mm. Uh, but uh, I'm going to, I personally would like to see the conference move to uh, probably uh, Worcester, more central, because uh, I, mm -hmm. I heard a lot of people complaining, especially from the western part of the state, how difficult for, it was for them to get down there. Uh, you all have a book on your table. Uh, they gave that to uh, all the participants, and as I walked out, there was a big table full of books, and I had already uh, acquired 25 umbrellas from MASC. Who, the guy didn't want to go outside, so I got them for s some of the people here in town. And so I walked up and I said, do you want to carry all those books back out? And he, they said, why? I said, I could use six or seven of those books. And they said, take whatever you want. So uh, the mm -hmm. speaker was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective, I, uh, it was really good. Uh, and I think it was a worthwhile conference. I'll let the other people speak to it. Uh, I, I would say this is, uh, for, for, it's tough for me to say. I've been involved in this for so long. Uh, but I did think it was uh, probably the best conference. They had uh, a tremendous variety of, of uh, sessions, and the, uh, the, the speakers were, were excellent. Uh, the, in, in, just as a side note, when, when I was president in 2004, that was while we were at Worcester, and we found that we had significant issues in terms of dealing with the uh, Folks in Worcester, the Worcester Convention Authority, who operates the Centrum, wasn't perhaps the best host for a conference uh, of our nature. And we got a lot of feedback from the MASC membership overall that they prefer to be in the Cape than in Worcester. But um, we're, we're nearing the end of that contract, and I know the association is looking for venues that are large enough to handle the conference and reasonable enough in cost because Boston would be very expensive. So we've got to more or less draw a circle around Boston and figure, figure out where there's a facility large enough with a large enough exhibit space as well. But uh, it was well attended, a lot of first time attendees there this year. Uh, at one point they asked the people to raise their hand if they were a first time attendee and lots of hands went up. Uh, this is very important professional development for school committee members. It's how we uh, interact with others to hear experts on topics that we're thinking about. Uh, it, it, and it's very necessary, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be associated with uh, MASC. S several of the uh, people raising their hands, the majority of the committee had just been reelected, just got elected. Mm -hmm. Uh, in cities and towns, which, which astounded me to put that many people. Some were appointments because people had left, but uh, five new members of a seven-member committee. Mm -hmm. And I just can't imagine how, how, how they could function right away. Cities do that. Yeah, I, I thought it was very well attended, when you, especially when you got to the major talks. Mm -hmm. The place was packed. Yes. Uh, they, they selected very well the major presenters. Mm -hmm. um, and it is an interesting um, book in terms of as supervisors when you're giving feedback you I think thinking about how it's received is the other part of that but mm -hmm. we probably in general don't do mm -hmm. enough of right. mm -hmm. and so uh, it was a very engaging speaker but I agree with you and I particularly for people who are just new to a committee I thought it was an excellent mm -hmm. conference to really get into the, some of the the deeper mm -hmm. understandings of some of these key topics Mm -hmm. I went to, the last one I went to was MSBA, uh, the gentleman that actually makes the decision who gets, mm -hmm. uh, and he said the first priority is health and safety. Mm -hmm. The second priority is growth. Mm -hmm. and, si and, and, and I said, w would, it be, uh, would it bother you to get information on a daily or weekly basis? And he says, if it's different information, he says, I'll take it as often as you can give it to me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as it changes, only if it goes up, don't mm -hmm. tell him it's going down. But, uh, <laughs> They, he said that they were, they were looking to approve 15 projects uh, out of 200 applicants. He said about 100 of those probably will get discarded right off the top because they're not, they don't meet the top two or three prior, uh, priorities. And so uh, I, felt good. I felt a little bit better for us. Mm -hmm. yes. Just to put your comment about committees having lack of experience or whatever in perspective, when Mr. Pierce and I joined the committee, um, I think the collective experience of the entire rest of 
Mr. Thielman had more experience in himself than all of the rest That's of us nice. added together. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. It, <laughs> so we've been there, yeah. and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really matter. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I I think it's a really important thing because it things is. happen when you're yeah. newer <laughs> and bumps occur. So. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time mm -hmm. to yep. really understand all the workings of it. It's 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 mm -hmm. it's at least a it's like your third year you start mm -hmm. saying, Oh, yeah, I'm starting to understand this a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, I just wanted to report. I went to the session on the foundation re budget review mm -hmm. committee, um, and they were really uh, um, soliciting input from different mm -hmm. districts um, about what people's challenges were. Um, they weren't looking at chapter 70 money, right? So mm -hmm. just, and there weren't necessarily, nobody's promising extra money, but, but I think the goal is to get an honest accounting. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we should push our legislators for, push people that we know. Um, mm -hmm. some intellectual honesty about really what it costs to educate kids and run schools and run districts. Mm -hmm. This time. Oh, I, just, I actually want to mention them, and I was debating whether I would bring up public but I think it's important to put this out there I was actually part of a focus group with the Department of Education on a proposal that they have they're looking to change the a lot of requirements around certification but one of them they have out there and they have it out there for public comment which is um, concerning to every sim single superintendent that was that there at this focus group and that is um, linking evaluation to license. Mm -hmm. We are just now in the beginning of this new, this new shift in terms of how we're doing evaluations. And we're, we're in this district doing a lot of thinking about, practice about inter-score reliability. It's been a focus of ours for a couple of years. But how do you have inter-district reliability and you're having somebody's judgment in one other district mm -hmm. making a decision about a teacher's license there was just a resounding no from the superintendents and I, I'll be interesting to see when they go out to new focus groups whether they take this off the table because mm -hmm. we said it should not even be there I mean maybe five six ten years down the road when we got this well established and they can really show that you have uh, this kind of consistency but mm -hmm way too premature yes I, I attended the afternoon focus group which was for school committee members I, I, I won't mince words I thought that the department's initiative in this is ill-advised and uh, really inappropriate um, let me tell you some of my thinking first of all uh, every professional board in the state be it physicians or attorneys or barbers or phlebotomists uh, anyone who holds a license or a certificate uh, ha has that certificate governed by a board of people who are active in that profession, except educators. Uh, my friend to, to my left, Ms. Starks, studied education very carefully, very thoughtfully, uh, learned an awful lot, and up until a few years ago, she would have been qualified to be a member of the State Board of Education, uh, which is the licensing authority until she got elected to this board which disqualified her by law and then a few months later she got a job teaching mathematics in a middle school which doubly disqualified her <laughs> and and it makes no sense that the people who are governed by a license don't have any say in what the license is or what the requirements are, what the professional standards are. And I am sorry, but the Department of Elementary and Se Secondary Education and the bureaucracy o over there really does not have the moral standing to be coming up with this sort of a, a, of a package. That said, uh, the department has also proven itself not to be a reliable uh, agency for granting and renewal licenses. The lag time has been tremendous. The person from the department said we've cleaned that up, but they do not have the capacity to make evaluative judgment on, on teachers. It is really up to us as school committees and superintendents and school systems to hire well to make professional judgments, to use the education evaluation system in order 
to make decisions on who should be teaching within our public school system. And the licensure process should not be a part of that because we know what is going in our classrooms. We know the capacity of our teachers and we know how to make rational decisions about who is educating our children. Uh, there is not a need to run unqualified teachers out of the system. That is a minor problem that it has enhanced provisions under the new regulations and evaluation system. We can move an unsatisfactory teacher out of classrooms. We do that. Districts across the state do that. Mm -hmm. The challenge in terms of education uh, ev educator evaluation is to set a tone of continuous improvement, of, conti of always having a goal, of always having improvement in your sites and adjusting your practice based on what's going on with, with the students in the curriculum. That's the purpose of the evaluation system. Mm -hmm. And to have the state get in the middle of the licensure as we're trying to have a thoughtful evaluation is going to be interference in the relationships we need to build in order to be successful, co uh, collaborative, responsible evaluators of professional staff. Yeah. Well said. I attended, um, it was in Boston at uh, Suffolk University, one of their uh, breakout sessions on a Saturday uh, with several teachers. Um, I was the only school committee member, but um, there were a bunch of teachers and administrators there. Um, I found that uh, they, they were listening. I don't know how much they're going to respond. Um, it'll be very interesting. Uh, because not only is every step of licensure tied to your evaluation, but it's tied to standardized test scores or DDMs or some other thing that we also haven't yet really gotten very good at doing, and so it was really kind of interesting. Um, one of the suggestions that came out of the group that I was working with was that what the DESE needs to do is focus more on those colleges and universities that are mm -hmm. churning yes. out teachers and making sure that they meet the standards and then making sure that districts all have some standardized mentor and mm -hmm. you know way that they are mm -hmm. training and helping teachers and they need to stop worrying about mm -hmm. the license like if if mm -hmm. i've gone through the correct program and i've done everything and i am working in a district that is doing the right thing then then you need to not worry about my license so much because I'm doing the right thing. And the license, it's very license, interesting. The licensing process has not been static, I think, for more than three months since, yeah. since 1993. Right. I mean, they've continued. Every time it starts to work well. Yeah, they change it. They, it's as if somebody says, gee, this is working. How can we fix it so it doesn't? <laughs> and I mean, I, I'm being, it's just crazy yeah. trying to do it. And young people, there are people that are thinking twice about starting a career in education for all the hassle that they're going to go through. On that note, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's been vivid. <laughs> <laughs>